think I wore this shirt last time on your stream. It's true. Can you see me on there? Yes. Okay, so it says that your stream started. Hold on, let me just make sure. So it says that your stream started. Just make sure. It's doing that thing where we can't see you. No, 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 no. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. It's doing that thing where we can't see you. No, no, no. Thanks. Hi guys! I am so excited to be here today. I hope you can all see me and hear me. And this is of course the beginning stages where I just want to make sure all the technical things are working. I actually uh, tried out a new program. I didn't really like the one last time because it was too chaotic. So I downloaded a new program last night and I stayed up pretty late <laughs> to figure out how to use it. So again, it's my first time using a program so we'll see how this goes. But I'll just wait for just a minute just to make sure you guys can hear me and see me and everything's going okay. If you can't hear me, let me know. But um, I have got so many notes. So many notes, you guys. I'm going to get started right away because I've got at least eight pages. <laughs> and when my husband saw that, he's like, oh, yikes. <laughs> I might be in here a while. So, again, my, my family's home. I do this live. So if you hear noise out there, just know that it's Saturday morning. My kids are home. I never know what they're going to do. So I hope all goes well. But if you have any questions as we go today, if, if you want to join the conversation and you have thoughts or things you want to share, feel free to leave a comment. Periodically throughout, I'll check the comments and answer them, and we'll make it more of a conversation. That's what's fun about these live videos. Okay, so I just want to get started. First of all, I want to show you guys, for those of you who are new or who are going to be watching this later after it's the live part is over, if you want to find out how to access the comments, because you'll see me reading comments and then you wonder, well, where are they? I can't see them. I'm going to show you real quick where to find those. So if you are on your phone, it's just right here down. It says live chat. I've circled it right there. You'll just click on that and it will show you the conversation uh, in the same amount of time as the video is going. So it will flow together. If you want to do it on your computer, if you're accessing this on your computer, then you're just going to go up to the side of the video, the right hand side, it says top chat replay. You'll just click on that arrow and the whole conversation will drop down so you can follow along. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to just kind of go in order of the notes. I tried to go over them last night to make sure they flow. I never like to jump all over the place, but sometimes that happens. So I'm going to go in order of the notes. And I just wanted to let everybody know out there, if you're new to this channel and you don't know what 311 means or 311 workers, it's a term I refer to a lot and I get a lot of people that will write me and say, what is a 311 worker? <laughs> so I just kind of put together a simple definition. It's basically believers who have their lamps full and we're seeking the will of the Lord in all things. And we're seeking his will to walk in third day power in this 11th hour. And so there's power in that. And it's also the wheat. In the scriptures, you hear about the wheat and the tares. I believe the 311 workers are the wheat. So a lot of times I'll see that number because it's just pointing me to things that have to do with things that the Lord's teaching me. It's a number I see a lot. We've talked about this before. I don't see it all the time, all day, but when I do see it, for me, it just means pay attention. I'm trying to show you something. <laughs> and I believe it's just because it's a number I, I, I tune into. So the Lord kind of uses that to point me in, in a direction. It's kind of like my, my breadcrumbs. So that's what that means. Now, first of all, you guys, after last week's video, after I was done, I realized that I forgot to talk about something. I forgot to show you an image I wanted to talk about, so I'm going to do that right now so I don't forget again. 
This, let me just show you, was a news article that I found on Fox 13 News. And some of you who, who follow me were in the same groups. You may have seen me post this. But if you remember, it was about the beginning of last year, possibly the end of 2017, there was a word that I heard one night, and it, I just heard it as clear as day, and it was the word trifecta. And I wrote it down in my journal, and I talked about it in a video, might have been a couple of videos, and um, I started to see that word everywhere. Prior to hearing that word in my mind, it's a word I never heard. And I know a lot of you said the same thing. After you saw that video, you started hearing it and seeing it everywhere. So at the very end of the year, this news article came up, and it says there will be a winter trifecta the next few days with the winter solstice, a full moon, and a meteor shower. And I thought, what a way to end the year. <laughs> There's that word again. And it was something I pay attention to. It was something that I pondered on in my journal, and I may talk about that again down the road. But I just loved it. There was that word again at the end of the year, and pointing pointing to this event, which had some, some meaning in it for me. So I just wanted to share that with you. All right, so I'm going to go in order, starting uh, January 1st, the New Year Day, New Year's Day. That's when I started making notes for this video. That's when things started to happen shortly after the last video. So as I ponder things, thoughts come into my mind, you know I just make a list of notes. And that's the order that we're going in. So the very first day of the year, New Year's Day, there was the Rose Parade in California. And I woke up that morning. My husband had it playing on the TV, so the kids were watching the Rose Parade. And all of a sudden, there was an event that happened during that parade. And it wasn't until the very end of the program, they had to end it early because of this event, that I realized there might be significance to that. So I wrote it down, and I actually didn't have a chance to ponder on it until just recently, so I wanted to share that with you. And this is all going to, to form a message, so, so bear with me. Okay, so in the, in the parade, there was a float. If any of you out there were watching, you probably know what I'm talking about. It was a float that broke down. It broke down in the parade. It was going, it stopped, it started smoking, there was smoke coming out of it, and it couldn't go any further, and it blocked the entire parade. So for like a period of 10 minutes, no floats were moving, there was no traffic going, and so the bystanders thought that the parade was over, so they all started leaving and going home. And when the news reporters saw this, they thought, well, time to end, time to end the program. <laughs> so they ended it early and then rebroadcasted it again, replayed it later. So this float broke down in the middle of the parade, which is something that rarely happens. And from what I understand, if it does happen, they can be fined anywhere from ten to $80,000 for that mishap. So during this parade, it, it was a particular float, and it was a representation of the Transcontinental Railroad coming together, the Golden Spike. And it had the two trains, the train coming from the west, the train coming from the east, and where they met. That was the float. And later, as I got thinking about that, <clears throat> and I was pondering, I thought, I think there's meaning to that. And I felt, I'm feeling it right now. I know it's something I always talk about, that when big events happen that kind of seem out of the ordinary, you know, record-breaking events or turmoil or just something that gets everyone's attention and the whole world is watching or the whole country is watching, I believe God uses those moments to send us a message. I believe everything happens for a reason. That's, that's just how I am. So I got pondering on this, and I remembered that earlier, well, we're now in 2019, so it would have been last year, 2018. <clears throat> it was about last fall. We went and visited this cute little train station museum up in Brigham City. And the man that was working at the museum told me, he said, hey, you guys ought to come up next summer. I think it's May, like around May 10th, that's the anniversary. He said it's the 150th anniversary of the Golden Spike. And there is a place just west of Brigham City. You guys, I can't believe I've never heard of this before. I live up north, and I find these things out all the time. It just amazes me that I've never heard of these things. But he said it's going to be amazing. You go out west of Brigham City, and they have the location where that event took place. 
and they're, I forget the name of it, but they have a special sort of festival going on to celebrate that anniversary this coming May, and it's going to be really big. They're going to kind of reenact it. There's going to be booths, food, things for the kids, all kinds of fun stuff, but he said it's worth coming to. So I wrote it down in my phone, you know, this is something we'll probably do. So as I am pondering on the event of this float crashing down, I'm reminded that it's the 150th anniversary this year of that event, of that float, and I'm feeling it right now. So again, I'm starting to feel there's, there's some kind of a meaning in this. So I'm thinking, well, what does that represent? That moment in history represented the West coming together with the East. This half of the country and this side of the country coming together and uniting. And I thought about that. Mm, I'm feeling it right now. <laughs> I thought about how that is the theme. That's kind of been <clears throat> the message I've been sharing consistently over the past several months is this unity in America. And especially among the churches. How we're, we're trying to do that with our tour right now. We're trying to unite America by uniting the body of Christ. But then I got thinking about it and I thought, well, the float broke down. It's broken. And I thought the Lord's trying to tell us right now that that unity is broken. It's broken and this is the year to fix it. Because if we don't do something about it, it's just gonna get worse. And I'm feeling it right now. I feel that's a strong message that this is the year to focus on bringing the country together, bringing the body of Christ together and uniting. And if we can do that, that will be golden. I just thought of that right now. I know that's cheesy. <laughs> so that's how the first day of 2019 started off for me. So I still am pondering on that. If you have any thoughts about that you'd like to share, go right ahead. In fact, maybe I'll glance down real quick. Hi, Nate. Okay. All right. So, okay, in the last video, I shared something from Beth. She shares a lot of amazing things in our group. And she talked about how the upcoming year, 2020, is going to be the 400-year anniversary of Plymouth, when the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. And I know we've kind of talked about that. We've had lots of conversations going about that in our groups, in these videos. And I had some more thoughts that I wanted to share. I had something really cool that I noticed. So let me just do a quick recap for those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, she was reading the story of Samuel the Lamanite to her kids. So it was in Helaman chapter 13. And she said that there was something that stood out to her, that it talked about the 400 year mark. And that is when the sword of justice would hang over the people if that sounds familiar in the scriptures. And so that stood out to her. She started pondering on that. <clears throat> and then that morning, in her own personal scripture study, she was in Alma chapter 45, and she said that's where Alma's giving his last words. He's passing the authority and the records down to his son, Helaman. And he gives him a warning about the exact same thing, that 400 years after Christ, there was that warning that has to do with the sword of justice. And I highly recommend, if this is new to you, write down those, those chapters, those verses, go read them, and learn about what the Lord teaches us about the sword of justice. So we have this conversation going. Now, not too long after that, I happened to be reading in 3 Nephi, and I wasn't even paying attention to what verse I was on or what chapter I was in, I was just reading. And all of a sudden, here's what I read. And it shall come to pass, saith the Father, that the sword of my justice shall hang over them at that day. And except they repent, it shall fall upon them, saith the Father, yea, even upon all the nations of the Gentiles. In that moment, I felt it. And I thought, oh, there's that sword of justice again that Beth was talking about, that we've been talking about in our group. So I highlighted that verse. Then all of a sudden, I hear in my mind, Pay attention. <laughs> Look a little closer to the details. I notice that I'm in chapter 20, and that was verse 20. 2020, third Nephi 2020, there it is, the year 2020. The Lord's perfect vision will be carried out in the year 2020. We've been talking about that. 
But in order for that perfect vision to come to pass, that sword of justice needs to fall. And I'm feeling it right now. And I laughed. I smiled. And I said, you are so awesome, Lord. <laughs> how did he do that? I don't know how he does what he does. But that was pretty cool. So I just wanted to share that with you. Go, go back after this video. Check out that verse. Ponder on it. It's pretty awesome, the things that I've been learning since. So I highly recommend it. Okay, so I got thinking about that, and in my mind when I heard Sword of Justice, Sword of Justice I thought, there, there is a statue in our nation that has to do with that. Lady Justice, she has a Sword of Justice. Let me show you her, her uh, an image that I have of her. Let's see, there she is. So here's an image of Lady Justice, and you can find this in Washington, D.C. I know they have lots of variations of the statue. I've seen lots of different replicas of it. And it's really interesting because you'll see she's got the scale in one hand and the sword of justice in the other. Notice that the sword of justice is in her right hand. The right always represents righteousness. Okay, as I got pondering on that, I know there's other versions where she has a, a blindfold on and there's a symbolism behind that that she is, it doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, what your status is, she's blind to that. She just brings justice as it needs be. And you'll see that in this particular uh, model of the statue, she's got the scale in her hand and it's balanced. It's perfectly balanced. It's in her left hand. Oh, you guys, this is coming to me right now. This wasn't even in my notes. I want you to know. This is just flowing down right now and I'm feeling it. I've got those spirit bumps. I wasn't even going to talk about the symbolism of what's, what's in her hands, and it's coming to me right now. And this goes with what we're going to talk about today, so this is amazing how this is happening. She has a scale of justice in her left hand. The left side represents the feminine. It represents women, the feminine, women, balance, bringing that balance, that equality. Okay, the sword of justice, the right side also represents masculine. This is amazing. <laughs> All right, so I can't wait to see the comments in a minute. So anyways, I got pondering on the statue and I thought, isn't it interesting that she's a lady, she's a woman bringing justice, the sword of justice. The sword of justice falling in the year 2020. I don't know what's going on in your mind right now, <laughs> but I can't wait to get to my journal later today. This is gonna be fun. Amazing, you guys. Okay, so I'm going to check back. I might have had more I wanted to share about that. I'm glad I have these notes because this is live and I wouldn't want to forget anything. So, yes, I did have some more notes on that. I, I was pondering on this. I think this was yesterday. And I thought about how ever since the fall of man, how Satan has had an attack on women. And that's something we know, we talk about. We know that he has really, really gone after women ever since Eve partook of the fruit and Adam and they fell. And so he's had this attack on women for centuries and we've seen that throughout history. Now, Satan went after the woman and I believe that the changes that are coming right now for women are going to change this. They're going to counteract his attack. They're going to bring balance. And so I have a lot more I could share about that, but I'm trying to keep this video hopefully under two hours today. So maybe we'll, we'll pick more up on that later, but it will flow into today's message. So don't forget. <laughs> okay, real quick, let me check the messages. I see a lot coming in. Tina, happy new year to you too. Nate says, very telling that the float breaks down and the government is fighting amongst themselves and we have a government shutdown. Nate, I'm feeling it right now. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. You're right. Government shutdown. There's symbolism in that. That's another major event that the entire world is watching with our nation right now. It's, it's shut down. It's the float shut down. Wow. The thoughts are just coming. I cannot wait to get to my journal today. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, Beth, oh wow, how cool with the 2020 verse. Yes, and now I know that that's you, Beth. Last time we were doing the live video, I, I didn't know who 
who that username was. Um, let's see. Okay, we'll stop there. So yes, awesome insight. Thank you so much, guys. I do love this live chat because you bring up points I hadn't thought about and it just makes the conversation and the video more interesting. Okay, so thank you. All right, you guys. So <clears throat> I mentioned before, I think I mentioned it in the last video and the video prior to that, that there is this prophetic man. He has a YouTube channel and I have his name this time. It's Charlie Champ. And I, I brought up one of his videos and I shared some things from it before. And I discovered his videos, oh, about a few months mm. ago. It was a few months ago. It just was one of those things where it popped up. I wasn't looking for it. I felt I was supposed to watch it. And I found a lot of meaning in there for me. And I shared that. So someone sent to me. Now, I apologize because I get so many awesome messages, emails, all of that from you guys. But when I put it in my notes, so what I'll do is I'll be on my phone. Somebody sends me a message or writes something awesome in our group, and I'll just copy and paste it and stick it in my notes, but I don't always put who it was that said it, and so I kind of forget. So if you're watching this and you're thinking, oh, that was me, <laughs> feel free to comment and say, hey, that was me, and I'll give you a shout out because I want to give you credit. I can't remember who sent me what, but this did not come from me. So somebody reached out to me, <clears throat> and she said, I highly recommend you watch this new Charlie Champ video, and it had just come out, so I hadn't seen it yet. And now I think I've subscribed to his channel, so I'll get the notifications. And it was all about women. Now keep in mind, everything I talk about in this video, the links are going to be down below. I've already got them. So if they don't show up now, they'll show up after the video is, is published, and you can watch it again later. Just go in, and I highly recommend you watch all the links that I put in there. I don't just put them in there as references, as, as sources that you can go to to verify what I'm saying. I put them in there so you'll explore. Because so if you have an appetite, if your taste buds have been um, wetted <laughs> and you'd like a little bit more, go to these articles, go to these videos, and watch them and read them in full depth because there's so much more than what I'm covering. So before I get into that, he had a newer video as I was taking notes of what I wanted to share from the video he did about women, he had a, another video come out since then, and it was prior to the end of the year. So I had already watched this a couple weeks ago, but I've gone through and dissected it a little bit more, and I want to share with you something incredible that I think is pretty important that he brought up. So he talked about, I can't remember if this was a dream that he had or an actual vision, if I remember correctly, he's more of a visionary person, so he has visions. And in this vision, he talked about how he was shown uh, a stadium in America that was shaking. He was shown this huge sports stadium. And all of a sudden, it just started shaking. He said there was an event going on. He didn't say what sport it was, but there were people in the stadium. There was something going on. And all of a sudden, the stadium just starts shaking, violently shaking. And he said that... It was being televised live on national TV, so it was a big, big sporting event. Uh, the whole country was watching, probably beyond the country. I'm sure people around the world who love this sport were watching. And he said that um, he was told, he felt that the meaning of this vision was that the stadiums throughout America are going to start being used for revival. Now, it's funny because, I mean, in our church, we have facilities where we we do our events. You know, we have the conference center when we have our general conference, and we have certain designated designated buildings where we have certain events. But outside of our church and other Christian churches, especially in um, the evangelical world, <laughs> they will rent out these big stadiums and these big conference halls, and they'll go on these crusades all over the world, and they'll rent out these large spaces, and people will pour in and they'll do Billy Graham type of miracles. And they'll call people down to um, believe, to take on the name of Jesus Christ, or just say that they want to start following him and be committed to him and give their life to him. And they call it an altar call. And so they do those types of things in these big stadiums and events. And I've seen it before. It's pretty neat. So he was saying how in the Christian world, we're going to start seeing these stadiums that 
typically are just used for concerts and sporting events, but we're going to start seeing them be used for evangelical type of events, bringing people to Christ. And they're going to be packed so full. People are going to be so hungry for the move of God taking place throughout the entire body of Christ. People are going to be really hungry for that, and they're going to want to come to these events. And so they're going to be used for revival, to bring more people into the body of Christ. And he said they will be filled, they will be filled to capacity for the purpose of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> when he said that, I was reminded of President Nelson, how last year he spoke at, I forget the name of the stadium, you guys, I believe it was in Washington, possibly Seattle. And he was there at that big stadium, and it was filled. And people came to hear the prophet. They came to hear his message. They came to hear the word of the Lord. People were hungry for that. He filled a stadium. It's happening. <laughs> I love that. I'm feeling the spirit bumps right now. And so there's more I'm going to say on that in just a minute. There's more to what he shared, but I'm going to pause right there. And I want to talk about my friend, my friend Lynn Reidenauer. And something he said to me once that has always stood out to me, I think I may have shared it before in a video, but he once said to me that he really, he really, really admires Latter-day Saints because he says we always have the Spirit with us. That's something that really stands out to him. He can recognize a Latter-day Saint member in a crowd of Christians because he says there's just something different about you. You always have the Spirit with you. It's, it's within you, and I can feel it coming out of you. And it's in your eyes. You can just feel it. It's just this presence that's within you. And it's this peace. He says, Latter-day Saint members are so peaceful. And he said, sometimes, you know, members of my camp, that's what he, he calls it. <laughs> you know, members of my camp will get talking about scriptures with other denominations. They'll kind of get into the heat of the, the battle. And they'll kind of what people call Bible bash and things like that. And he's seen that happen many times. But he says, you really won't see that with Latter-day Saints. They're really peaceful and calm. They just share what they know is true, and they don't look to be right or prove a point or kind of force that truth on other people. They just share their testimony, and they let it be, and they just let the Holy Spirit do the teaching. And so he loves, he loves that about Latter-day Saints. And so he said, you know, for people in my camp, for the rest of us, he says, we have these moments where the Holy Spirit falls upon us. And it just, it's kind of like this opening and the Spirit's just poured out upon us. It's an external thing that comes in. And we feel it. <clears throat> That's when we begin working in miracles and we see amazing things happen, signs and wonders. But it's something that, that's outward coming in. It, it comes from above and it falls upon us. And it happens in moments. And it got me thinking about the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God versus the Holy Ghost. Because we know that everybody, every man, the scriptures teach us, I think it was Mormon taught us, that every man is born with the Spirit of Christ within him. So everyone has the Spirit of Christ. And the Holy Ghost is the gift that we get at baptism to, to always have that with us. And the Holy Ghost teaches us and uses that light of Christ, that Spirit of God, to do the teaching. He uses that light to, to get his work done. And there's a couple of, of links that I have that talk more about this that you'll see at the end of the video. One of them is one of Mike Stroud's podcasts. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that one. And the other is an article I found on LDS.org that also talks about the same thing that, that Mike talks about. So you can't go wrong with either one. But I love that because when Lynn told me that, it got me thinking about that and how <clears throat> the Spirit of God... I thought about the song, The Spirit of God. It's one of my favorite hymns. The Spirit of God, like a fire is burning. So I forget who wrote that hymn. can't think right now. But the person who wrote those lyrics describes the Spirit of God like a fire burning. Okay? Now, stay with me. <laughs> I heard in my mind as I was pondering that the Spirit of God is the glory of God. It's God's glory. It's intelligence, it's light, it's fire, it's power, it's God's glory, it's all of that. And in those moments, 
when you feel the Spirit of God coming upon you, you, you feel His glory. You feel like you're standing in that presence, and it's an amazing feeling. And as I got thinking about this, I got thinking about how I believe that's what we're going to see more of. We're going to see more of that this year in 2019, all throughout the body of Christ. We're going to see the Spirit of God like a fire is burning. We're going to experience that fire. <laughs> I know there's lots of references to that fire all throughout the scriptures, and it's that incredible experience. It's like a kind of like a born-again experience. When you feel that fire, you feel like it's cleansing you and you've been made new, you've been born again, and you're so much more passionate to go out and be a disciple of Christ when you feel that, when you feel that. So um, anyways, back to what Charlie was saying in his video. He brought up something really interesting, and he said that he found out after he had that vision that there was an earthquake in 1989 at a place called Candlestick Park. And I believe this was in San Francisco. <clears throat> it has since been torn down. <clears throat> Sorry. And he said that when he, when he learned about this, this earthquake that happened at Candlestick Park, he heard in his mind, um, candle on a hill. The Lord talked about and reminded him of that scripture about a light on a hill, a city on a hill. And he heard candle on a hill, <clears throat> light on a candlestick. San Francisco was supposed to be a light on a hill for the Lord, but he took away the candlestick. He took it away. And so God had other plans for that city. And as we can see, um, Satan also had plans. <laughs> and so God took away that candlestick. Throughout that video, Charlie said the words, rise up. Over and over and over and over. I heard it, I heard it, I heard it. And I'm feeling it right now. He said, rise up, rise up. I'm pretty confident that he said, he made a call out to the people of San Francisco and said, rise up. All you believers of the Lord who live in San Francisco, all you members of the body of Christ, no matter what de denomination you belong to, it's time for you to rise up and be that light again. Be that light on the hill that God intended for you to be. I felt so much power in that. <clears throat> now, I can't remember. I don't have it in my notes. But there may have been a stadium. Candlestick Park might have been a stadium, and it crumbled. Okay, so he said stadiums are going to rise up. Um, when I think about a stadium, I think about a structure that that is a it's, it's up there. It's, it's on a platform. It's something that rises up. You can see a stadium. If you're driving anywhere, I like to think, I've seen some incredible soccer stadiums in Germany. And, you know, if you're driving through the countryside of Germany and you come in through these cities and, you know, everything's just green, green grass, green fields, trees, woods, and all of a sudden you see this huge stadium rise up as you're coming into the city. The stadiums always stand out. You can always see where they are. It's something that really grabs your attention. So um, I got thinking about it, and I thought, what major sporting events are going to be this year? I think you can see where I'm going with this. And I've thought about the Super Bowl. I never watch the Super Bowl because it's on Sundays, and I've just, sorry, guys, I've never been a big fan of football. Sorry for those of you who love it. Um, I'm just not a big fan of football. But Super Bowl happens to be on February 3rd this year. And that's 2-3, February 3rd. That's the number 23. 23 is the 23rd hour of the day. It is the 11th hour. There's symbolism in that. I felt that, so I highlighted it. And it's going to be in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, he said, I'm not sure if this was all symbolic or if there's actually going to be a physical shaking during a live sporting event this year. But if there is, that's the message that the Lord's trying to share with us. He's trying to let us know that the Holy Spirit is coming and it's going to hit the stadiums all throughout America and the body of Christ is going to rise up. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I, I thought of some other things. I thought about how also in February, that's when our Believers Building Bridges tour kicks off. It's supposed to be, I believe, in Independence, Missouri, and it's going to kick off there towards the end of February. So it's interesting that 
I keep seeing February and some amazing things that will be happening. Now, some other events that will be happening this year, of course, there's the World Series that's supposed to be around October 22nd through the 30th. And the NBA playoffs are in June. I can't think of any other major televised sporting events that would be happening this year, but let me know if there's something I'm not thinking of. I don't know, hockey? <laughs> I don't know. Let me know. But those are the ones that stand out the most to me. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, I'll get back to his other video later on. So I just put that out there for you to digest. Let me know if you have any thoughts about that, but that was too incredible not to share in this video. It's going to tie right into my message. Let me check with the comments real quick. How are we doing on time? We're doing okay. Okay, somebody wrote. Let's see here. You guys are amazing. Oh my goodness. I need to catch up here. So, how interesting with this year being 9, 2019, and that representing women. Yes, we're going to talk about that, Beth. Um, Nathan, the Democrats took the House and are now really fighting the executive branch. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, there is a lot of chatter surrounding <clears throat> Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her declining health, the importance and the Supreme Court in the balance of power in our country. Wow, I felt that. There is definitely something to that. Again, it'll be fun writing in my journal later today. <laughs> uh, Beth, interesting because outside of Utah, the prophets and apostles visit sports stadiums for regional events. That is true. President Nelson visited the Saints in the San, that's right, San Antonio area. Yes, that is right. That is right. So I don't know if we're going to see that happening in Utah at all, but definitely it's already happening. It's already been happening. Uh, many say that she may step down soon and that the Kavanaugh process will pale in comparison to the scrutiny and drama that will continue with the next justice nominee. The deep divide continues. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the more Satan works to divide, the more God needs us, the body of Christ, to rise up and unite. Growing up, President Monson visited us in Houston. Oh, that's awesome. Let's see. Podcast number one. Thanks, Nate. I believe, are you referring to Mike Stroud's podcast? <clears throat> Candlestick Park was in San Francisco where the 49ers played. That's right. During a World Series game in the 1980s, the city of San Francisco suffered a large earthquake. How could I forget that? <laughs> Thank you. I, I remember hearing about that. I saw something about that on a TV show. I can't remember what it was. Thank you, Nate. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is um, something that's been done before. But I think what's awesome about this, what Charlie has shared, is now if we see it happen, we kind of know beforehand what that message is. Um, this, is hap this happened during the game. What a way to get our attention, right? <laughs> when things happen live, like during the Rose Parade, <clears throat> when things are happening live, that's something that you can't edit out. It's, it's already been seen by all the eyes of the world. So God absolutely takes advantage of those moments. And he uses that to give a message. So, thank you guys. Okay, moving on. We're still on the first page, but don't worry, I will speed it up. Okay, I just threw this in there. I couldn't find the right place to put this in my notes, but I just wanted to throw it out there. It will tie into some other things later on, probably. It's just interesting to me that there's been these things happening this month in the news locally probably also outside of Utah and other places. But there's just been these strange booms. I think I've talked about it maybe in a group or in a past video. I've talked about it before. I live in northern Utah, so we hear them pretty often. I want to say at least once every other year, like every two years or so, we'll hear a boom so loud that everything in the house shakes and it feels like an earthquake. And it can it can catch off guard. <laughs> it's it's not so pleasant. I remember the first time, or when we lived in our old house, I had a sleeping baby, and it happened, and I thought it was powerful enough to wake up the baby. So that's how powerful they are. They happen all the time, but what's funny is, is every time they happen, the local news will do a story on it, calling it a mystery boom, unexplained mystery boom, asking people, you know, what their theories are about it, and 
it's funny too because the way they talk about it in the news stories, it almost sounds like it's the first time it's happened. <laughs> and so I went in to, it might have been KSL, and I commented that no, these happen quite often, and the news usually will always do a story on it. But I found it odd that within a week's time, we had one in northern Utah, and then one down in South Salt Lake. And, and there was a man, so I have all these links, you can watch them later. There was a man who was interviewed in South Salt Lake because his security camera caught it. And, and I guess down there, they have a flash that lights up the entire sky that is accompanied by the boom. And no one's ever been able to get to catch it on camera before. And so the police have never been able to look into it and investigate or do much with it. But this man, his security camera happened to catch the flash and the boom. And so he gave that to investigators and they're looking into it. They're trying to find out where it came from because they're calling it a nuisance. <laughs> it's an, a nuisance that the people of Salt Lake have had to put up with over the years. So just because it made the news again, and it made the news during the same week that this northern Utah boom made the news, I feel there's there's something to be had in that. There's something for us to pay attention to. And um, the only thing that comes to mind for me right now, to be honest, I haven't spent a lot of time pondering this topic, but I just think how in 2019, it's, it's not going to be a quiet year. <laughs> the presence of the Lord, all these events happening, it's going to be boom. It's going to be loud. It's going to be sort of in your face, right? Something you can't just miss in the blink of an eye. It's going to be loud. It's going to be big. And so there's a, a big boom happening this year. And I just I just thought that was interesting. I That day that the, the boom happened in northern Utah, I was in the temple that day with my husband, and it was such a busy day. I think it was like this, it was, was it, well, I think it was last weekend, so it would have been last Saturday. And there were so many lines in the temple. We waited and waited. We did more than one ordinance, so we were there pretty much the whole day. And that's when it happened, and it's pretty soundproof in the temple, so we didn't hear or feel anything, but a lot of people did. So if you have any comments about that, please feel free to share, but definitely something to pay attention to. There's something to know about that. Okay, so back to Char Charlie Shamp. I'm going to talk about his women video now. So he said in a video he made towards the end of the year that there is a mantle coming upon the women of the church, the body of Christ, in the year 2019. But there is a mantle coming to the women of the church. He said, um, 2019 will transition into a new decade. So it will go from 2019 all the way to 2029. He said, pay attention and get ready for the awesome things that are about to happen with the women in the body of Christ. I'm feeling it right now. I don't know about you. And he said, um, he said, women are going to be coming to the forefront in so many areas. He said, he referred to the women in this decade as champions of faith. They will be champions of the faith. They will be powerful and, uh, and anointed women of God. God will use them to be a great influence over all of society. He will use them in so many areas. I'm feeling it right now. He said, because women are going to slay the demonic forces that the anointed men previously could not take down. Now, that's not to put, <laughs> that's not to put men down or, you know, the men in the body of Christ. No matter what denomination you belong to, it's not to put the brothers down. What he was saying is that because of the faith of women, because in the year 2019, going into this new decade, their faith is going to rise up. There's that word again, or those words. Rise up. Their faith is going to rise up. And because of how powerful their faith is, remember in the Book of Mormon, the 2,000 stripling warriors, who taught them how to have that kind of faith? It was their mothers. Because the women are capable of having that kind of faith. And they've kind of been suppressing it. They've been suppressing their faith to be used in, in these kinds of ways, but that's going to change. And as that faith comes out of them and, and just <laughs> shines out upon the world, 
That faith will be so powerful that it will slay the demonic forces that previously have not been able to be taken down. So we're going to see big changes happening. And he said, because of their great faith, they will be given authority, um, authority to do these things in whatever arena or capacity the Lord has um, given to them. So whatever their calling is, whatever they've been sent here for the earth to do at this time, they'll be given that power and authority and blessing to do so. So we're going to see some amazing things happen. And that's women all throughout the body of Christ, all over the world. So I'm feeling it. Now we're, we're, we're getting into this more. I'm still on the first page, you guys. Pray for me. <laughs> I really want to get through this because there's so much awesome stuff in here. Okay, so... Um, I wrote in my journal to ponder more on this. I'm still pondering on it. And every day as I ponder, I get more and more. So <clears throat> as I first started pondering upon this, all of a sudden I was coming across all these videos. I wasn't looking for them. Uh, I believe the first time this happened, I just pulled up YouTube. I was ready to wash dishes that day. And the first thing that pops up in my feed, if it looks interesting or I feel drawn to it, I'll just watch it. So that was the case for this day, and a video happened to pop up, as many other after that, many other videos after that, that all had to do with this topic. It's amazing. And the Lord was telling me to ponder this. He said, I felt in my mind that many changes are going to unite women and men. So it's not that these changes are going to put women above men. Um, that, would be, that would be imbalanced unbalanced. I don't know what's better English. Imbalanced, unbalanced, unbalanced. <laughs> Anyways, the whole purpose is, is for that balance. And so um, it, it's going to bring that. And let's see. Yes. So the video that I was talking about, there was a video of a Christian woman. I've got the links to all of this, so check it out later. I forget the name of her channel, but she has had a YouTube channel for quite a while. And she's a former fashion model. So I'm not sure if, if her old videos used to be more about kind of secular things like makeup and fashion tips and things of that nature, but now it's all about spiritual things. And she has this YouTube channel, and recently, sometime last year, she received some powerful personal revelation, and it's, she felt so awkward sharing it, and she fought it for so long, and she shares this in her story. But this was just specific revelation for her. She wasn't saying that this was something that the Lord wanted women all over the world to do or women of the body of Christ to do. It was just personal revelation for her. And she obeyed. And that personal revelation was for her to wear a veil over her head, just a covering, just a covering over her head like a scarf, like a shawl. And not a veil that covers her face or anything like that, but just a head covering. And she, she was to wear that always. And she fought it for a while. She felt awkward and strange and thought people would make fun of her, especially because she has such a big YouTube channel and she's a fashion model, and right? But doing that changed her life. And she's had so many incredible experiences since then. It's always amazing how when we obey the Lord, when he's telling us to do something that seems so out of the ordinary or so out of the norm, and we're afraid to do it because we're afraid what people might think, but we take that leap of faith and we do it anyways, it's amazing how our life changes and how he blesses us. That's been her experience. So the title of the video was something like, um, let's see, I, I wrote it down somewhere, something about why I choose to wear a head covering or something like that. And the video was pretty interesting. But when I watched this, I felt something powerful. And I thought, okay, the Lord's been telling me to ponder women. And here's this video. And I, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, are you wanting me to cover my head? And no, he wasn't. He wasn't wanting me to wear a shawl on my head all day or anything like that. So I thought, okay, okay. But he was wanting me to pay attention. And so I still continued to ponder. And I was reminded, I wasn't going to share this, but I think I will. I think I will. So um, maybe this is for somebody out there. I don't know. I was reminded of a time a few years ago when I felt one day I received some revelation for myself. I wrote it in my journal about how um, I felt that the Lord wanted me 
to cover my head, just put a shawl over my head, only when I'm in my deepest prayers with him in my prayer closet. And that by doing that, I would notice a difference with my prayers. I would notice a difference. And I did it for a while, and then I would forget or get lazy. And I remember I stopped doing it, and then one day it came again. No, you need to do this. You need to do this. Just have it over your head just when you're in deep prayer with me. Not when you're praying over your food or, you know, things of things like that. So I did, and um, again, I, I stopped doing it. And this video, I started pondering on that, on that again and um, believe that's something I need to go to again with the Lord. So I just wanted to put that out there. But anyways, there was something he really wanted me to pay attention to with that video. Now, this was still back in December. Okay, so after January 1st, um, I guess I'll just say, <laughs> I'll just say that there was a lot of amazing conversations going on in a lot of the groups that I'm in, and somebody posted something. It was an article that was written this year. Uh, it was written by a member of the church. I forget. I have all the links, so they, they will be posted in this video. But it was something about unveiling women in 2019, how the Lord plans to unveil the women, or as a whole, he plans to unveil woman, the woman, I don't know how to say that. And, and I wrote down, I, I watched, I read the article, I, I read through all the comments, and I wrote down in my notes that the light will really shine this year from women. And there was a woman who referenced a statue that she saw in Washington, D.C. Now, I couldn't find it. I swear, I've seen it before. I can see it in my mind. I don't know what it's called. And I searched and I searched for 20 minutes last night and I could not find it. But she said there was a statue. I believe she said it was in the basement of the Capitol building or something like that. She was looking up and there was a lot going on. There was a lot of art on the ceiling, but she noticed this statue-like clay-colored woman who had a veil on and she was taking it off and unveiling herself. She was removing the head covering. I can see something like that in my mind. I don't know what the name of that piece of art is. If you do, please share below, but that stood out to me. And, and so she was recently there, and that connected for her. And so, so yeah, the, up until 2019, the women have been veiled. We're going to get to more of that in a minute because I got some new inspiration about that last night. I'm so excited to share. I'm still on the first page. I, I'm going to speed this up, I promise you guys. Um, <clears throat> I happened to come across a documentary last night. I didn't finish watching it. It was too long. But I've got the link for that as well. There was some German women or European women who did a documentary on women in Saudi Arabia. And I believe this video came out six months ago, so it's fairly recent. And there's a lot of change happening right now in Saudi Arabia for the women. And they go through all that change in the video. And it's showing how these women are now being given more freedom to do what they're passionate about and share their talents with the world, where before it was so hard to do that. They felt really suppressed and hidden. Now, when she was interviewing one of these women... It was interesting what this woman said. She said, she said, I don't like the veil. I don't like to cover my face because I feel like that hides a woman's identity. I feel like for all these years, our identities have been hidden as women. But now we get to show who we are. Our identity is coming out and it's exciting. <laughs> and I thought there was some symbolism in that. 2019 is the year that our identity is going to be made known to the world and, and we're going to be a great benefit with all of our gifts and all of the things that the Lord has blessed us with to come here to use at this time on the earth. Wow, we're really going to shine this year. Not something to be excited about. Okay. I have turned a page. Hooray! <laughs> Progress! Let me just check on the comments real quick, guys. Um... <clears throat> Okay, I don't know if I need to refresh it. We don't see anything coming in, so we're good. Okay, so there was a commenter who commented in one of these groups on this article and said, I really like this comment. He said, just remember that we veil the most sacred things. We veil the heavenly realm, the Father, the Son, 
angels, the sacrament, and women. A veil always makes me think of a bride. Oh, this is my own thoughts. <laughs> I can just tell you. Well, I wrote down in my notes that a veil always makes me think of a bride. And I thought about how it says in the scriptures that the bride represents the church. Whenever we hear about the bride, you know, we hear about the bride and the bridegroom. The bride is the church. And we also, when we hear about the church, um, the church represents the woman. We hear about the scripture about the women going into hiding in the wilderness. That's the church. So church and women are synonymous. Is that the right word, you guys? Um, they go together. They represent each other. So I wrote down, the woman is the church, and the church is the bride of Christ. What? <laughs> I know that's nothing new, but for some reason it was like an aha moment for me as I made this connection again. I'm going to say that again because I really want you to ponder on that and think about that. The woman is the church, and the church is the bride of Christ. You veil your bride, right? The bride wears the veil. And the groom lifts the veil from the bride. So Christ is lifting the veil from off the church. Not just from, from the bride or, or from the woman, but from the entire church because that's what the woman represents. So that veil is, is being lifted, which means the kingdom of heaven can just come right in. <laughs> and... That's just another witness to me that amazing things are on the horizon, you guys. I am so excited for this next decade. I'm going to talk more about the kingdom of God coming on the earth in a little bit. That is something I pray for every day, that thy kingdom, that thy kingdom come on earth and thy will be done in heaven as it is on earth. So and I pray for the kingdom to speedily come. I pray for it to speedily come and I always pray for the speedily or speedy return of the Savior to the earth. That's something I, I never leave out of my prayers. Okay, so <clears throat> there is another article I've posted in my links, and I really recommend this article. I highly recommend you read it, but I took a little uh, snippet out of there. I'm just going to read it to you. It says in this article, I, I'm not sure if it's a blog. Anyways, it's, it's really good. It's an article. Joseph Smith makes only one change to 1 Corinthians 11 in his inspired version. He changed the word power in verse 10 to covering. In Joseph Smith's mind, a woman was to have a covering on her head because of the angels. In this context, when female saints covered their heads with veils to pray and to prophesy, they functioned with divinely acknowledged Power. I'm feeling it. Got my spirit bones. I read this after I was reminded of how I used to pray in my closet. Another little witness for me. It becomes a sign of obedience and an exercise of faith, which opens the door to the ministry of angels. So it says, check out Moroni chapter 7, verses 29 through 33 and 37. It goes on, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman, sorry, this phone is, is going off. It's my son's phone. Um, for, as, for as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. That's 1 Corinthians 11, 11 through 12. Paul ends his explanation by stressing the complete interdependence of men and women. Woman was created for man, while man is born of a woman. Paul's description encompasses the Edenic creation and birth process. In this unique role, each mother opens the veil to mortality, just as Jesus opened the veil of immortality. A woman's womb symbolizes a veil of life as spirit children pass from heaven to earth through her, through her womb. In this task, woman acts as a veil. And I'm getting my spirit bumps again. <laughs> Paul ends his explanation by stressing the complete interdependence of men and women. Woman was created from man while man is born of woman. Oh, Sorry, I just read that. Um, Eve is a type of the church, 
as Adam is a type of Christ. As Eve was made out of a part of Adam, so the church is a part of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is called his bride, as Eve was Adam's bride. Um, typologically, Adam and Jesus wounded, oh, are wounded in the side to bring forth the life of Eve and the church, respectively. As Adam's wounded side produced mankind, so Christ's wounds provide the way for mankind to return to God the Father. Christ is the second Adam, and as the Savior champions fallen humanity. Eve represents all of those born of women who become the church and join Adam Christ in a um, Adam slash Christ in a covenantal relationship. Furthermore, Adam and Eve were commanded to be one, and in like manner, Christ and his church are to be one. The body of Christ is to be one. In this allegorical scenario, the church or Eve works through the mediator Christ or Adam to become unified as the scriptural bridegroom and bride. There's scriptures referenced to that. If you just go to the article, you, you can see all those scriptures, but it's Isaiah, Revelation, and Joel. Okay. So, I, I was going over all this and reading this and putting this in my notes after I had pondered on what I just shared earlier about women and being the bride in the church. So, for me, that's a huge witness. Nothing new, nothing we haven't heard before, but I guess I could just say it this way. I'm pondering it in a way I never have before. I'm looking at it from a new perspective as we go into this year. Okay, let me quickly check the notes and then we're, we're moving on. Great veil and bright analogy. Awesome, <laughs> thanks Nate. Um, I agree, that was great insight. Thanks Beth. Okay. All right. So last thing I want to say about that is I, I did a video in 2017. I pulled up the link and I've got that below for you guys. For those of you who watch my old videos, I know some of you find me, you find my channel and you just are interested in the new videos. But I just want to really put a push out there for the old videos because um, there was a couple of years in my life where I walked in incredible miracles. I mean, it was like a daily thing in my life, and I shared those in those videos. There's just some amazing stories that I haven't referenced in quite a while. Um, so as I was going back and listening to those old videos, I loved being reminded of those experiences. But there's a particular video I wanted to bring up. It was from May 2017. I call it my Wonder Woman video, <laughs> and um, I kind of laugh at it now, but, but I, I put a link to that if you want to check it out. But that was the first time for me when the door began to open, in my mind, um, for women to start healing and rising up. I talk all about that in that video. It was when the new Wonder Woman movie was coming out, and I had just seen the trailer, and I went and watched it. And I had so many powerful personal revelations just from watching the trailer, but then also during the movie. And... I just had spirit bumps constantly. I was being told so much in my mind. And I felt it about around that time that there was a shift taking place with the women, um, not only in the church, but all throughout the world. I could just feel it. And I believe that 2019 is the year the door officially opens. So um, I, I, I noticed after I, I put this in my notes, I was going through my notes last night, and I thought, Oh my goodness, that was also the year, 2017. It was actually officially October of 2017 when that Me Too movement began and women started speaking up about being sexually abused in their industry. And uh, that's when that started. And that's when I started to feel that shift take place was back in May. So, what, a few months before that movement rose up. So these were all just signs coming up that were showing us what's what's going on because everything that happens in the natural, everything that we see going on with our physical eyes in the news all around us, those are just representations of what's going on in the supernatural, the things that we can't see. Those are reflecting what's going on on the other side of the veil. <laughs> so that's why these things are always a, a big deal for me and I like to pay attention. Okay, 
All right, so the, the title of this video today, the topic today is about your identity and knowing who you are. I know I'm talking an awful lot about women in this video, but for all you guys watching this, this is for you too. So don't tune out just because I'm, I'm referring to women. <laughs> so in one of our groups, in our group, we were talking about um, somebody posted, I um, can't remember what she said, but she was talking about unicorns. This is funny because, oh, about oh, four or five months ago, like at the end of last summer, I had it in my notes for one of my videos that I was going to talk about unicorns. And then the video got to be too long, and I just didn't get around to it. So I scratched it out of my notes, and I never brought it up again. But when this person started talking about unicorns, it came to my memory, and I felt this is something I'm going to share. I'm going to fit it right in in this part of the video. <clears throat> so she shared this post, and I just took, to make it easier, I just took some screenshots of my response. I wanted to share some things. I'm just going to show you word for word. Here it is. So I wrote, I love this. I had a thought about unicorns. I saw the same video. Oh, she was referencing a video she had seen about how unicorns have invaded um, pop culture and how it's a bad thing. Um, but I, I disagree. I don't necessarily, I don't think it's a bad thing. In Vern Swanson's book about the holy bloodline, he talks about how unicorns were believed to have represented Christ's posterity. That's something we've talked about before in videos. Um, I believe I, I wrote about that in a blog post. So when you saw them on a family crest, it meant that that family had the bloodline back to Christ. Somewhere in the book, it talked about a theory that in the very end days, the descendants of Jesus, the unicorns, will rise up and use their healing gifts to heal the world <clears throat> before Jesus returns. <clears throat> it talked about how that's why in the legend, the unicorns were hunted, meaning that Christ's posterity were hunted down as they went into hiding throughout Europe. Placing the unicorn on the family crest signified those families were of the lineage of Jesus. And the lion represented the royal bloodline, such as through King David. So to have both, the lion and the unicorn, was very significant. The majority of the early saints of the church came from England. They were the most eager to join and moved to America. Their conversion grew the church at that time when it was crucial for the church to grow and built up Zion. They recognized that truth, so when they heard when they heard that, that word being preached to them, they recognized it as truth. Um, it was in their DNA. It's like their DNA was lighting up, reminding them that this is this is encoded in them. This is who they are. Ephraim was gathering and uniting. Your post reminded me of this. So I shared in this group this image right here. This is the crest of England. You've got the lion on one side, representing that royal Davidic right to reign and rule. And then you've got this unicorn on, on the other side, on the right side. So unicorn on the right, which is funny because right represents male, it represents righteousness, left represents um, female. Um, anyways, you've got this unicorn, but what I started to focus on when I first saw this a couple years ago was the crown around the unicorn's neck, and it's got a chain tied to it. The unicorn is in bondage. The unicorn is chained up. But it's interesting that the chain is linked to the crown, and it's not wearing the crown on its head. It doesn't have that authority. It's in bondage. This is the crest of England. So there's a lot to be said about that. For sake of time, I'm just going to ask you to ponder that more and see what the Spirit speaks to you about it. Okay, so second part. Let me go back. <clears throat> um, doo -doo. Sorry, guys, I lost my place. Here it is. Okay, here's the second comment I made about this. It's interesting that the unicorn wears a chain and the crown of royalty is around the neck attached to the chain. The lion wears the crown on his head. It made me think of how the descendants went into hiding and they, along with the followers of Christ, were oppressed. The priesthood line was departed from the mainstream church and in the meantime, the royal Davidic bloodline ruled and prospered. In my notes, it says that Christ's posterity would heal the wasteland 
in Isaiah 58. God is calling the Ephraimites to unite. There's that word again. The unicorn was the first animal named by Adam, but it was more like a wild ox or a bull. And that's the sign of Ephraim. Christians liken the unicorn to Christ, an emblem of the grail or the bloodline. Medieval legend says that all but a few unicorns were ruthlessly hunted and killed. The rest went into hiding. Two lines of authority were needed to maintain the Church of Christ, the apostolic and patriarchal. They were split and both apostatized. They went into spiritual bondage. Now Joseph Smith changed all of that and was of the royal and patriarchal lineage of Jesus. He was the Grail King and was to be an ensign to gather the people and lead the tribes. Jesus' Y chromosome has marked about 66 to 72 generations for about 1,800 years. And let me just scroll down, you guys. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so Jewish tradition has pronounced two messiahs, one being an Ephraimite and one being of the royal house of David, Joseph Smith and Jesus Christ. His mission would come when Elijah returned. He would restore purity to the family. Having ancestry from England and throughout the UK, I truly feel this links a person who has that ancestry into that holy bloodline. I wouldn't doubt if all 311 workers have this in their DNA, and that is why they are drawn to this mission and this work of uniting the body of Christ. All right, you guys. That was a lot. <laughs> Let me get you back, back to the camera here. That was a lot, but the reason I bring that up, that could be a whole video in itself, and I really don't want to dwell on that. I know for some people, um, no matter what denomination you belong to, if you're watching this, that might sound like heresy to you. That might sound preposterous and might not be something you wanted to hear. I'm just sharing that because for me, it's, it's something I've been pondering personally. It's something I don't talk about that often so openly, but for some reason I really felt like I needed to share that in today's video because it ties into my identity or to my message, which is about your identity, the identity. <clears throat> So um, I share that because I feel like if we're going into this new year and we're to be powerful and rise up as the body of Christ, as 311 workers, it's so important to know who we are. It's so important to know who you are and where you come from. And not just spiritually. We all know we're children of God. We all know that. But there's something really powerful about tracing back your family lines. There's something really powerful to that. And I will say that we had a little conversation about this going in our group, and a lot of us were encouraging each other, go back as far as you can and see what you find. And it started with a couple people. They were sharing what they were finding, and it motivated the rest of us to do the same. And for the first time in my entire life, if you are in that group, you saw that post, I traced one of my lines all the way back to Adam and Eve. I didn't know that was possible in my tree, <laughs> but it was already in there. I just had to follow the breadcrumbs back. And I shared a little video about how I did that and how to do that. If you're interested, um, maybe I'll post that to my YouTube channel later this week so you can watch it. It's just like three minutes long. <clears throat> but a lot of us were saying something that we all were noticing was that there was something really powerful once we did that. Once we started going back to those bloodlines to Israel, uh, we started getting these people in our tree who um, lived in Israel and, and grew up in Jerusalem, and we recognized their names from the scriptures. And you start to see your line, how it ties into that. I mean, I started with my great-grandpa's line. That's the line I followed. And I've shared his story before about how he was an orphan, so for years and years, we knew nothing about him. It wasn't until about 10 years ago when I woke up to wanting to do genealogy because I found that dusty old book in my house that shared a little bit about who I was, where I come from. I got so excited, and I worked long distance through email with my great aunt who lives in Washington, and together we solved this mystery. And the Lord led me to this tombstone that had the wrong name on it, which happened to be the mother of my great-grandfather. Through finding his mother, we got through an entire line. That line 
um, is the line that goes all the way back to the beginning of the origins of our country. So these were ancestors that have been in America for hundreds of years, all the way back to England, all the way back through all those royal bloodlines, and they tie into my Danish lines. So it's my Swedish lines, my Danish lines. There was some Swiss lines, German lines, my English lines. Um, there might have been Finland, Ireland, basically the UK, Scandinavia. They all came together and tied into this one line. It's so cool how that happens. So if you find in your tree family members from England or from the UK, follow those lines first because they're always connected usually in, into royalty. And those royal lines go all the way back through these great ancestors, all the way back to Adam and Eve. It was really cool. And for some reason, there's something about doing that and seeing that connection happen and finding that ancestor where it links in. It just makes you come alive and you feel like, wow, this is who I am. These are my, my ancestors. They're watching me right now. Their blood flows through my veins. That's powerful. <laughs> I'm here at a crucial time on the earth right now to do something special. And they're on my team. They're supporting me. They know what I'm capable of, uh, what I'm capable of because they know that I come from them. They know who I am. And it's just exciting. It's just something awesome about that. So I just want to put it out there, if you haven't done so, find out who you are and where you come from. And it will really wake up and ignite that passion inside of you. Okay. So, all right, let me just check real quick. Um, let's see. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm using my son's phone because for some reason it won't let me read the comments on my YouTube channel on my phone because I'm logged in on my desktop. So I have to use his phone and his phone goes black a lot and I have to get in with this password and it has a limit on his YouTube time. So, okay, real quick. There is, oh, I love it. Lots of comments. Um, the unicorn can also represent Ephraim. Yes, absolutely. Ephraim, there's something special about the role of Ephraim right now with this t on the timeline. So study more about that if you're not familiar with Ephraim's role in the last days. I'll just put it out there. It has to do with the gathering. It's all a part of this uniting that we're doing. But yes, um, the red lions represent Perez Judah, first twin that line of David comes from. And other red lion represents Zara Judah, the red thread twin of Judah. I just read about this last night. Awesome, Beth. I'm going to have to look into that. Um, there's a great book called Whence Came They by Von E. Hansen, Ph.D., that explores how the people of the British Isles come from Israel. That is pretty cool. My list of reads right now is through the roof. <laughs> That's my goal for this year is to finally get through all the books that I want to read. I'm going to add that to my list. Um, Crystal, you've talked about this before. The Native Americans know who they are. Yes. Thanks. I forgot to put that in my notes. Uh, they know who they are because they know their history well. That was inspiring to really dig and find out who I am too. Crystal was one of um, the people in our group who made that discovery as well. So awesome. Yeah, that's a great reminder. Sean Little Bear talked about that. I shared that in a past video last year. He said that, um, that people don't know who they are and um, Native Americans know who they are. So that was one of the reasons why they weren't very interested in listening to the the white missionaries that would come deliver the, the message to them because they didn't know who they were. And it's very important for them to connect with who you are. So so it's very important that I that Native Americans know where they come from. They're very good with knowing their history. But a lot of us, a lot of us that migrated <laughs> from across the pond, our ancestors, we just come to a, you know America, this big mixing bowl of people, and we just get lost in our history. And we forget to look back and trace our roots, but it's so important in this final hour that we do that. Okay, I'm going to talk about now some events that have been happening in the news. And again, this is all going to tie in at the end. So there's links to all of this I've got below. And the first event I want to talk about is an article I know I shared in a group 
it was about uh, planet Earth being alive. And I think it said planet Earth is alive. Deep beneath its skin, this is what the article said, deep beneath, deep beneath its skin, its lifeblood are rivers of molten iron. So that's the blood running through the Earth. Um, it pulses around its core. And this mobile iron is what generates the magnetic field that causes the auroras and keeps us alive. I've talked about this in my happy bug videos, my Catching the Happy Bug 4 Series workshop. That's in the Happy Lady channel if you want to go back and check that out. But I talk about in there how we all have our own personal magnetic pole that runs around our body. So we have our magnetic field and that's what creates our aura. Um, it's, it's part of that. So a lot of this was going through my mind as I was reading this. But according to, let's see, the scientific journal Nature, something strange is going on deep down below the Earth. It's causing the magnetic North Pole to skitter away from Canada towards Siberia. <clears throat> let's see, but the movement of the North magnetic, magnetic Pole has been the object of study since 1831. Initially, it was tracked moving into the Arctic Ocean at a rate of about 15 kilometers each year. But since the mid-1990s, it has picked up speed. It is now shifting at a, at a rate of about 55 kilometers a year. So it went from 15 to 55. Um, now this isn't new news. A lot of us have been aware of this for quite some time now. This has been something that's been talked about in the scientific world. But this is the first time I had seen a mainstream media news outlet pick this up as a story on the front page as a headline. To me, that, that was significant. So I decided to ponder on that. And right away, as I was thinking about it, I just heard in my mind the words hastening, speeding up, time is speeding up. And we see, we see evidence of that, especially with with. The weather, the weather patterns, the storms are more intense and more frequent. They're happening more often. Everything is more intense and everything is, is changing and speeding up. And to me, that was just a manifestation of that because the earth is changing. And so the earth is getting ready. It's getting ready for something big. I think you know what that is. <laughs> and that's why I'm so excited for this next decade because amazing things are about to manifest that are gonna be a huge witness of this. Okay, so I'm moving on to the next event I wanna talk about, which is the Super Blood Wolf Moon that's happening on January 20th. Um, again, there's number 20. Makes me think of the year 2020. Um, so somebody brought to my attention that that fire I talked about in a past video last year, one of the California fires, the big one, that just, just ignited out of nowhere, um, it was called the Woolsey Fire, and Woolsey means wolf. And there's that word wolf, because as I was pondering on the super blood wolf moon, I thought, what am I to know about this? Am I to know about what, what the words mean? Why is the word wolf in there? Um, am I just to pay attention to things that happened that day? Um, I know it's significant. I'm still pondering and trying to connect those dots. But someone reminded me of that fire. And someone pointed out to me that someone posted an article about the Native American names for the different moons. You know, they, they go off the cycles of the moons, that's their calendar, and so they have a name for each moon, for each cycle. And the moon in January was called the Wolf Moon because that was a time when the wolves would come near the, the villages and they would howl because they wanted food, they were hungry, so they call that moon the Wolf Moon. But it's a super... Um, blood moon, but it's a wolf moon. There's something to that, you guys. There's something about that number 20, it being on January 20th. I'm putting this out there because maybe you'd like to ponder and maybe some more insight will come to you and, and maybe you'll, you'll be willing to share that. And if I get anything more on that, I will share it in the next video. I just felt like I was supposed to put that out there. Okay, moving on. There was an article someone shared also about a story about Bill Gates and the article was, was about, I forget what it was titled, but I, I do have a link to that, so you'll be able to check it out. But it was about how Bill Gates is doing an experiment. He's funding an experiment that begins spring of this year, 2019, 
It didn't give an exact date. It just said spring. And this experiment is where he is going to block out the sun. He is going to block out the sun. It explains how he's going to do it. It's something called a volcanic winter. Um, I'll explain what that is, but it, it makes reference in the article to the same process that happens when there's a volcanic winter. So you have this major volcanic eruption. And when this happens, there is a reduction in global temperatures caused by volcanic ash and droplets of sulfuric acid. And the water obscuring the sun and raising the Earth's albedo, which is increasing the reflection of solar radiation. Um, so it blocks that. It blocks, it blocks the sun. And so he, with this experiment, he is going to mimic what happens during a major volcanic eruption. Now, throughout history, if we go back to the times, you can Wikipedia this. That's what I did. I'm just going to talk about one of those events. But it lists, if you look up volcanic winter, it lists the times throughout history when we've had these major volcanic eruptions throughout the world and how that changed the weather. And it's called a volcanic winter. And I picked this one to, to bring up. It was the 1815 eruption of Mount Tambora, and it's a stratovolcano in Indonesia. It caused what became known as the year without a summer. It was a year-long winter. Now, if you read the other volcanoes that have taken place throughout history, it also mentions crazy blizzards, record snowstorms um, happening throughout the year because of what happens scientifically when that volcanic ash goes into the atmosphere. So Bill Gates is trying to recreate this effect, and who knows what that's costing to do, but his purpose is to block the sun from hitting the earth so that he can stop global warming. So <laughs> I'm just going to say about that, I heard exactly what this lady pointed out. I forget who it was. I don't know if she even wants me to say her name. I think it was Janice. I, I'm, anyways, let me know if it's you, if you're out there. But she commented that when she read Bill Gates is blocking out the sun, she heard, and I heard it too, sun spelled S-O-N, capital S. They're blocking out the sun. This is a manifestation of what's going on in the supernatural. My kids are trying to get my attention. What, bed? Honey, Mama's in a video right now. What? Not lunch. Oh, go ahead. You have lunch. Good boy. Okay. So, so in the supernatural, there's that battle going on constantly. Good versus evil. The dark side versus the light. And that is Satan's plan right now is to block out the sun, to block out the Savior, to block out Jesus Christ from the earth. And if that's what's happening right now in the natural, if that's the plans of man right now, in the natural, that tells you what's going on right now in the supernatural. I heard pay attention. But I also heard in my mind, I heard scriptures, specific scriptures come into my mind. So I have uh, put those in my notes. I'm going to read the first one. Isaiah 60, verse 2. In the last days, Israel will rise again as a mighty nation. There's the word rise. The Gentile peoples will join with and serve Israel. Zion will be established. Oh, sorry, you guys. This is the preface leading into the chapter. So it's a description of the chapter. Um, Zion will be established. Finally, Israel will dwell in celestial splendor. Okay, verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen up upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. When I heard that Bill Gates was blocking the sun from the earth, I heard in my mind, darkness covers the earth. Darkness shall cover the earth. This is a prophecy from Isaiah. And gross, dark, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee. I'm feeling it. And his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Woo! I'm feeling it. It's tying into the whole message here. <laughs> we really are going to rise up this year and be a beacon of light. And the kings of all the nations are going to notice that light. They're going to be drawn to it. It's part of the gathering. And the people that are living in darkness right now, a lot of those people 
are going to want something different. They're going to get tired of that, and they're going to see what's going on in the light. They're going to start to be drawn to that. Our bright light is going to pull people out of the darkness. But that is a prophecy that Isaiah gave, and we can see that happening right now. Okay. I also heard the scripture, uh, Moses 7, 61. And the day shall come that the earth shall rest, but before that day the heavens shall be darkened, and a veil of darkness shall cover the earth, and the heavens shall shake, and also the earth, and great tribulations shall be among the children of men. But my people will I preserve. Okay, feeling it, you guys. That's what I love about doing these videos is it's just a constant couple hours of spirit bumps <laughs> and warm awesomeness. Okay, so I wrote in my notes, um, rise up. I heard in my mind as I read the scripture, rise up. I heard in my mind the rising sun. The sun rises in the east. The rising sun. Rising sun in 2019. Rise up and be the light. The natural always reflects what's happening in the supernatural. Okay, I was reminded when I was pondering on this. Uh, I pondered again on it last night, but I was reminded of this right after the last video that I did. I thought about the baptism ordinance and that symbolism of that resurrection power. When you go under the water and you die, and then you come back up out of the water and you rise up unto everlasting life, it represents that resurrection, that resurrection power third day power, right? So I was reminded of that and how that's what we're going to see in this 11th hour is that rising up resurrection power. Um, I believe, this is just my notes, this is me, I believe that we're going to see supernatural powers and manifestations coming back into the church, coming back into the body of Christ, period, in general. Um, I believe that people are going up until now, prior to this happening, this is why this needs to happen. I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of people over the years so hungry for more, so hungry for you know the supernatural manifestations and all these awesome and amazing miracles and signs and wonders and things of that nature. They've been craving it so much that they started looking for it in other ways and going down other paths. And, um, and a lot of people, I, I know some people in my own life who were led into great confusion and eventually into some darkness because they wanted it so much and they, they were tired of being patient and they thought, well, if, you know, I can't get it through prayer or directly from the Lord or, um, you know, through, through my experiences, my, my spiritual experiences. <laughs> then I'm going to try to find it these other ways. But I want to have these experiences, and I want, you know, these supernatural manifestations. I want to experience that. I'm hungry for it. So they started looking for it down other avenues. And so I believe that the Lord's aware of that, and he knows that people are hungry. They're hungry for this. This used to be a part of not only the early church um, after Christ, um, after he, he died and was resurrected, and the church went on, the, the very early apostles, this was very much a part of their ministry, these crazy, amazing miracles and supernatural manifestations, speaking in tongues, healing, all of that. And then, it, you know, eventually it went away and, and the apostasy took place. Now, when the church was uh, reor or reorganized, when it was brought out of obscurity, <laughs> when it was restored, that's what I'm looking for, when it was restored, um, these, again, were those great signs of the early saints of the church. If you read in your, your ancestors' journals, I know I have in mine, and also just in church history, you'll read about these incredible experiences that were just like the apostles of the early church. Speaking in tongues was a daily occurrence. It happened in church meetings. It happened in the temple. It happened all the time. Great healings happening in public, in front of people. People went to church to get healed on the spot in front of the congregation. They went to church to have these powerful manifestations of the Holy Spirit and feel to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. They went and had these amazing experiences and people were so hungry for that they were drawn in and the church just grew. Now over time we saw that fade away 
And I think people over the last couple of decades have been really hungry for that. And the Lord knows it's time. It's time. That's a part of bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. When you bring the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God to the earth, that's what comes with it. That's what's part of the package. All these incredible manifestations um, that we call supernatural because we can't explain them. I believe that we're going to see that rising up. We're going to see that coming again, coming back. And let's see. I lost my place in my notes. Um, let's see. I... I will say this, I, I know from people that I know, <laughs> I know over the last 10 years there were people who had unfortunate experiences where they were having amazing experiences um, that were of the light and they were learning about these incredible spiritual gifts they were discovering that they had and trying to make sense of why they have this gift, what they're supposed to do with it. They know it's of the light, they know it's a fruit, it's a good thing. But, but especially being women, um, they were hesitant to use it because they didn't want to overstep the boundaries or do something that um, wasn't okay. And so a lot of women were kind of doing this on the down low, using their gifts and learning these great things and having these incredible experiences and, and manifestations, but they were having to do so quietly because as they would go to their leaders, the leaders wouldn't understand it and would tell them to suppress it or that it was probably of the darkness or um, not always, not all leaders, but a lot of leaders were not encouraging them to nurture and use these gifts because they, they had a lack of understanding. They didn't understand the gifts. And so I know there was a period of frustration, especially among a lot of women in the church and in the body of Christ. This was also happening in other denominations um, where these women felt kind of I'm frustrated, so I'm a little shameful. Why do I have these abilities and these gifts? And what am I supposed to do with them? Um, I, I know I'm supposed to use them, but no one's showing me how or what or allowing me to. I feel like I need to suppress it. And that put a lot of people into um, some you know, depression, anxiety, um, kind of weakening their testimony, right? And I, I know the Lord's aware of that, and that's why things are changing and, the, and things are changing so quickly in the church to allow for us to, to have more of a, an open mind to these things that are part of the manifestations of the kingdom of heaven. This is third day power in the 11th hour. That's what it is. That's really the best way to describe it. it it's as simple as that. And people are starting to slowly understand what that is. And they're starting to be okay with it. And that's been my experience. I know I've shared personal experiences I'm not going to bring up again in past videos about incredible, amazing things that, that I manifested through my faith that were like, I, the only thing I could compare it to is miracles of the New Testament. I wouldn't have believed it myself had I not been there experiencing it myself <laughs> through my faith because my faith was strong enough. And when I shared this with some brethren in my family and in, in the church, um, they, I got a different reaction and I wished I never would have shared it with them. They were really upset about it and confused by it and told me to suppress that, not talk about it. I wasn't a brother. I didn't have the priesthood. I didn't have authority. I shouldn't be um, participating in healing or acts like that, even though it was just through prayer and faith. Um, it sort of weirded them out, I guess you could say. And I mean, that was years ago. And so for me, I went from this phase, I think I wrote it in my notes, I went from this phase of being really excited about what I was learning and what the Spirit was teaching me and manifesting that through my faith to all of a sudden being afraid and confused and not understanding and disappointed and feeling like I have to go under the radar and suppress that. And that weakened my faith, it weakened my light, it dimmed my light. But then I've come out of that over the past couple of years and I'm in this place now where I'm so ready to do what it is the Lord has sent me here to do, to use my gifts, my, my talents, all of it, to be a part of this gathering and uniting the body of Christ, which I believe is going to play a huge role with the Believers Building Bridges tour. So I'm so excited about that. Sorry, you can probably hear my kids. Okay, so real quick, we take a break, 
and check the notes. We're 11.44, so we still have some time. Um, I just want to see if any of you have any thoughts about that. I don't want to ignore your thoughts or questions before we move on, but it should move pretty quickly after this, you guys. Let's see. No, nope, we're good. Okay. So, Neville Johnson. I've got a link to his video, but I watched a video this year, or it was at the end of last year, possibly. Um, it was Neville Johnson, and it was a video he did about the year 2019. I've shared his stuff before. I really like him. I have so many channels that I follow and watch, and I'm not always um, standing there waiting for their next videos to come. It's just when they pop up on my feed, I'm reminded and I watch them. That was the case for this video, but it was powerful. And in this video, he talked about what I talked about in the last video message. Remember I talked about that story about 2 Kings and Elijah in the book of 2 Kings? And I was led to that because I was doing my family history and I learned about this father and this son. And it was a news article that said two kings burned in the fire father and the son. So the spirit told me, go to Second Kings. It talked about the fire and the spirit of Elijah or the, that power and those miracles that told a story about, about the fire consuming the armies. Anyways, just a quick recap. So in Neville Johnson's video that I was led to, he talked about Second Kings and Elijah and that power in the last days. There was that witness again. Neville Johnson said that this is the Elijah power this Elijah power is what transforms the church to the kingdom of God. Woo! I'm feeling it. I'm not going to say a whole lot about that other than ponder on that later. Ponder on that later. Think about what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is the government. It's the government of heaven. It's God's government. The church is going to transition into that government. It's going to be different. It's going to be. It's going to look different. It's going to operate different. Um, I mean, it really. It's. It's really going to be a night and day difference in what we've known over the last several decades. But it's through that Elijah power that that transition happens. That's why that Elijah power is so crucial right now, and we're seeing the fruits of that Elijah power constantly, especially through through. Um, Family history work. Okay, so I wrote, we're going to be transitioning. Oh, no, this is what Neville said. He said, we will be transitioning from new beginnings. Remember, that was the message that I got too. 2018, the number eight, eight was the gate, the door opening to a new beginning, a new birth. Um, eight represents, you know, the age you are when you're baptized, the new birth. So 2018 was all about new birth, new beginnings. So Neville says we're going to be transitioning from new beginnings into the fruits that are going to be manifested from that. So the, the door has been opened to the new beginnings. That was all of last year. Now we're going to start seeing the fruits, the actions. We're going to start seeing things happening in the natural that are going to manifest what's already happened in the supernatural. Okay, I heard in my mind, by your fruits, ye shall know them. It's these fruits that are going to draw people in to this gathering. They're going to see the fruits and say, I want to be a part of that. That makes me feel good. There's truth in that. There's power in that. These people are of God. And let's see. This is the year that the world will know who the body of Christ is, who the wheat are, the 311 workers all over, right? Right? Um, that's, that's what I heard in my mind. That's what the Spirit told me. Okay, last on this topic of, of events, there's a video I sh I've shared in the link, uh, the list of links down below, so be sure to check this out. But it's a man talking about sacrifice. And he has an incredible story. He has experienced some amazing fruits of the Spirit, you guys. You really want to hear his story. And it has to do with with sacrifice, how sacrifice leads to those things. Now, I know some of you are participating with me in this 40-day fast that had to do with January 3rd. It started on January 3rd, and it has to do with what the Lord's trying to do this year, in the year 2019, and how we're fasting, that those doors can be opened for Him to be able to do, to do that, and for us, the body of Christ, to be able to carry out His will and do what He needs us to do. 
So we've been fasting for that. And that was from a Charlie Champ video. That was a request that he made. So when I heard this video about sacrifice, it tied in to the timing right now of this 40-day sacrifice at the beginning of 2019. And he talks about in his video of what sacrifice does. I thought of Jesus Christ. I thought of when he he did a 40-day fast. And that 40-day fast began his ministry. When he ended that 40-day fast and he came off that mountain, he knew without a doubt who he was. He knew what he was capable of. He knew what he could do with his power. He knew his mission. He had seen it. He knew how it was going to end. He knew what was coming next. He knew all of it. And he began to walk in those miracles. And he began that ministry and he started gathering his apostles and his disciples and went about preaching and healing, and, and that ministry really blossomed. But it was it was that 40-day fast that opened that pathway up for him. And so there is something really powerful about a 40-day fast, but also about fasting and sacrifice in general. It really does open up doors for um, the supernatural. Okay, back to women now. We're tying this all in, you guys. And... Just real quick, I'll check, see if anybody's got anything that they wanted to share. Nope, we're still good. I haven't refreshed it, so I'm sorry if, if there are comments there. Okay, back to the women. More voices are rising up, you guys. That's what I'm hearing in my mind, that we're going to hear more voices rise up. <clears throat> like I said, it started for me in 2017 with the Wonder Woman trailer. I felt it back then. And there was a time, I wrote in my notes, there was a time when many of us felt like we had so much to offer, but we were unable to be valuable. That's what I wrote in my journal was, I feel like I have so much to offer. I have so much to offer. I have so much to give that can really help others, but I don't feel valued. I don't feel valuable with what I can do. And I know that sounds harsh, and, you know, we're taught and it's emphasized often, especially in our church, that women are valued. They are valued, and we know that, and we've been taught that, and we hear that, and I believe that. But for me, from personal experiences, just speaking personally, I had had these experiences where I went to share what I could offer, and it was suppressed. I was told, shh, no. <laughs> and, and it was okay because I learned over time that the timing wasn't right, but eventually it would be, and then the Lord would help open up those doors and rekindle my faith. So I believe that's the time that we're at right now for women. And, and as I was processing back and revisiting my old thoughts, my old journals, I wrote, you know, there is conflict because you know it's a part of your destiny, but it goes against tradition and culture. So you know you were given these gifts and abilities because you're supposed to do something awesome with it. It's part of your destiny. It's why you were sent here at this time. But because it goes against your tradition and culture, the traditions and culture that you live in, there's this limit. You feel limited. And so there's this conflict. You feel this conflict going back and forth, right? So you feel this natural obligation to rise up and shine your light in the areas that you've been predestined and commissioned to. But there's a ceiling in the way. There's this, You're hitting your head on the ceiling, and, and it's kind of frustrating. And I'm, t I'm here to tell you right now, in 2019, that ceiling is opening. That ceiling is opening. And the Lord is ready to use us on a new level. So that's, that's what I've been feeling. Um, I wrote in my notes, up until now, the desire has been created. Like I talked about in 2017, that desire for me was there. I wanted to rise up as a righteous daughter of God and, um, and a, a woman of powerful light. So that desire was created, but 2019 is the year that the action takes place, that those fruits begin to come forth. God is opening the pathway. It's not about power or selfish desires. It's nothing personal. It's, it's not something to want to happen so that you can glorify yourself. It's all about knowing that as a woman, you have something powerful. As a daughter of God, you have something powerful and valuable to offer the world, to offer everyone. 
Um, but you feel restricted because you're a woman. You, you don't have that authority. You're not a brethren. You don't have that priesthood. I know in other churches, women say the same thing, that because they're not a, um, a brother, they, they feel restricted. It goes against culture and tradition. So what am I trying to say? I believe that God is opening up a door, a pathway this year for, for his daughters. And he's going to show us how he's going to use us and how those gifts and abilities uh, are, are a part of the timeline right now. The time is now. It's time for us to rise up and he's going to use us. I am so excited, you guys. And we're going to continue to see that, that manifested throughout the year. Okay, so there's these articles. Right as I was pondering this on January 1st, just this succession of articles, just article after article, just popped up on Facebook, on Google, in YouTube, uh, just all over the place, all having to do with this topic. So again, it's a manifestation in the natural of what God is doing in the supernatural. So the first article I want to share, again, these links are all down below. It's about a female chief from Malawi. And the title was, Female Chief from Malawi Uses Her Power to End Harmful Practices Against Girls and Women. So I clicked on the article, and what stood out to me right away is this chief, this woman chief, she herself was married at the age of 14. So she was married off at 14. It was part of tradition and culture, and these women get married right at a very young age and they go right into having families and they miss out on education and you know they're still developing they're still learning and growing they're still children and they miss out on that so she has taken upon herself to use her authority her power to end these harmful practices of these young girls being married off and there was more to it there were these sex education camps that they were sent to at the age of 14 before they got married to teach them their role as a woman with their husbands. And they had to learn those things, and it was very harmful for these young girls. And so from personal experience, she knew and wanted to make those changes. And here's a quote from her. She says, I have eliminated some cultural practices that were deemed harmful to women and girls, and I have made sure I will never see these practices happening here again. And she has stuck to that. <laughs> So I put that article down below. Check it out. It, it, it took place this year. It's a new article, and it was another witness of, of how God is using women to slay those demonic forces. Okay. Um, when I heard that, the Lord said in my mind, if you're going to rise up, remember who it is you represent. Can't forget that. Not only we as daughters of God, but all of us as brothers and sisters in Christ. As we rise up this year as 311 workers, we can't forget who we represent. That is so important. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Real quickly, I, I wanted to throw this in right here. Then I have some more articles I'm going to quickly share. I had an experience with a woman, a sister, a dear sister at my family history center and these have always been encounters over the phone but I just wanted to say that well, maybe I'll share a little bit of what happened um, I called to schedule an appointment back in December because I wanted to come in and transfer my VHS tapes into digital for family history purposes and I, I tried to do it online or I called because the website said you needed to reserve the rooms so I called thinking I needed to reserve it over the phone and I got this, this sister, and she was very kind of sharp with me, um, not very kind, um, and just told me, you need to go to the website. It's on the website. Just go to the website. That's why we have a website. Everything's done through the website. You know, don't call this number to do this. And it wasn't so kind to me, and I thought, well, that maybe she's having a bad day. So I went to the website, figured out how to do it, reserved my rooms. Then I realized after I'd reserved them, I had a dentist appointment that day with my family. So I thought, well, it's easier to change this room reservation than a dentist appointment. So I called. I tried to change it online. It showed you how to do it, but it wasn't, it wasn't working. I would do what it said. I would refresh the page, but it still showed that I had that hour reserved. So I didn't think that was fair. I, I thought that that should be fixed so someone else could use that time. 
So I called back the Family History Center, a little hesitant, got the same sister on the phone. This was, I think, later that day. And I explained to her what happened, and she said, well, then you've done it wrong, or you don't know what you're doing because you can do it through the website. So you probably don't know what you're doing. And she kind of talked down to me and belittled me and made me feel kind of a little bit bad. And um, wasn't very nice. <laughs> so I said, well, okay, I, I'm not sure if it's a technical problem. Maybe it is me. Either way, I'm calling so that you guys know about it, so you're aware of it, so you can unlock that reservation so someone else can have it. And she said, oh, okay, okay, I suppose I can do that. So I said, okay, all is well. Goodbye. <laughs> so anyways, um, the day of our dentist appointment this week, I get a phone call right before our dentist appointment, right around the time of the dentist appointment, and it's this woman. It's the Family History Center. I didn't answer the call because we were running out the door, but when we were uh, later that day, I was listening to the message like 20 minutes later, and she said, you have this room reserved, and you're not here, and so that's not good. <laughs> because of you, we've had to turn people away who couldn't do their family history because you signed up for this and you no-showed. Please call us back. And it was the same woman's voice. She sounded very upset with me. And I thought, oh, no, I have to talk to her again. And she's not going to be nice. So I called her back and I said, hi, I got your message. I'm so sorry. You probably don't remember. I called. It might have been you I talked to. But this room would not unlock for me. So I called and you guys said you would, you would figure it out and, and fix it for me. So I, I wasn't able to come in today. I canceled it. And I rescheduled. And she said, well... The day that you rescheduled for, she, she looked at the calendar. She says, you've, re you've blocked it out for an hour and a half. You can't do that. You can only have it for an hour. You can't do that. And, and she started again talking down to me and being very unkind to me. And, and I just, I'm the type of personality, I just laugh about things. And all is well. Life goes on. It's all, it's all okay. And I said, yeah, I remember. I remember when I talked to you on the phone. You told me that back then, but I couldn't go in and change it. So I had gone in and, and reserved those appointments. Then I called her to tell her the other one wouldn't unlock. And that's when she said, well, these other appointments you have, you've reserved for an hour and a half. You're not allowed to do that. And I said, well, it won't let me change it. So I told her, I do know that now. So I was only planning on staying an hour, but it won't let me change it in the system. And she got upset with me again and said, well, now all these other people are going to miss out that could have reserved that half hour. And, you know, you need to not, you need to think of other people and just was really unkind to me. I'm going to keep praying for this sister because she might be having a hard time in her life right now. Um, you know, I give everyone the benefit of the doubt. But the reason I'm sharing this is because the rest of that day, I felt, I just felt a little off. I felt, you know, when someone talks down to you and they're not very kind to you, you kind of feel a little bit of shame. And that's what I was feeling. And I told my son about it. I, we went to go on this beautiful walk together. He was out of school. And we were on our walk. And I just said, oh, I just can't kick this feeling. This lady was so unkind to me. And it's just hard because of who she represents. She's a member of our church. And she represents the Savior just like we do. She's a disciple of Christ. But I don't feel Christ when I'm in her presence or when I'm talking to her. I feel the opposite. And that's hard for me. But I'll get over it. But I thought about how other people who, who may have encountered her and got that same vibe, and maybe they're not members of the church or they're not Christian or, or whatnot, they don't have that knowledge or that um, faith, that could have really have shaken their, their whatever faith they have. It could have ruined their day. It could have caused them to look down upon members of the church or people who represent Jesus Christ. And I just heard in my mind that we need to do better. We need to do better remembering every day when we interact with people who we represent. We need to remember that. And it actually says that in my patriarchal blessing. It says in my blessing that to remember that I represent Jesus Christ wherever I go, and there will always be lots of people watching me, so I need to remember that. Now, the day after the last video, that day, I remember I was in a hurry, and I said, oh, we got to end this. Well, it was my dad's birthday, and we were all meeting to celebrate his birthday at Chakarama <laughs> down in Draper, Utah. And it was so funny because I had been thinking about this, and we got there. We walk in. We're, we're waiting. There's a wait. So we're in line, standing in the hallway. There's like 20 of us, a big group. And all of a sudden, I mean, 
I always try to remember who I am and who I represent, not just because I'm the happy lady, <laughs> not just because of, you know, I people in my neighborhood and my ward know me and see me, but because I represent Jesus Christ. And in that moment, I could have been a little harsh with my kids, or it could have been chaotic. There was a big group. Our kids were running around. We're in a busy restaurant. But I chose to smile and, and enjoy everyone's company. And all of a sudden, this woman walks past me. And she runs up to me and she says, oh my goodness, you're the happy lady. <laughs> I watch your videos. And it was so funny. It was so unexpected. And in that moment, the Lord reminded me, remember who you are. People will always be watching you. Remember who you represent. You never know who's watching. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I feel that's a message for everyone this year. Okay, it's now a little after 12, so I'm really going to speed things up. Real quick, I'll just check the comments. Don't want to leave anybody behind. Maybe I should refresh it. Sorry, you guys. Okay, well, I, I'm just going to let that be. Okay, so here's the next news article that came up this year that's right on target with all of this. It was an article about women in India and their temple. And this was shared in a couple of places. The article said that there were two women who were accompanied by plainclothes police officers under the cover of darkness early Wednesday morning, this was the first week of January, and entered a centuries-old Hindu shrine in southern India that has long barred women of childbearing age. Later that day, a third woman entered the temple. Their effort was part of a continuing push for women's equality in the country. When news broke that the women had made it inside of the temple, a Hindu priest shut down the complex for purification rituals, which typically occur only when there is blood spilled in the temple or children accidentally urinate. So they have to shut everything down and purify the temple. And so the, the article pointed out that women are seen as unclean, and that's why the minute... They, I guess you could say, are of that childbearing age and begin to menstruate. They are never allowed to go in the temple because they will always be unclean. It's been that way for years, for centuries, in their culture. So it's sad that these women finally wanted to go in the temple, and they did. And after this happened, violent protests broke out. One person was killed, and 14 were injured. Several dozen women have tried to enter the temple since October of last year after India's Supreme Court ruled that the ban on women of childbearing age was unconstitutional. Um, but none made it inside as thousands of protesters blocked the temple's entrance. Then on New Year's Day, let me show you the picture. On New Year's Day, this is what happened. The women formed a human chain. It's a frequent form of protest in India. But these women stood shoulder to shoulder along highways in southern India, creating a wall 300 miles long, according to Communist Party officials. But party officials, oh sorry, but according to the party officials, they said 5.5 million people were in that chain. However, local police authorities estimated that the number was 3 million. That's a pretty big chain either way. And so, I've got another picture of it right here. It's pretty neat. Images say a lot of words. They're just powerful. But here these women are, just smiling, just happy. Just, the Supreme Court had made that change, but they weren't being allowed to, to apply it. So, this was their way of saying it's time. Um, anyways... It had to do with a temple, it had to do with women, and it had to do with changes. And it, this happened on January 1st, and I see this happening all over the world. Again, it's a representation of what's happening in the supernatural. I love this and just wanted to share. Okay, now, around this time, I had been hearing the word Bluetooth, 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 Bluetooth. <laughs> Not in a way that I wrote it down in my journal. I was just hearing it constantly, and I'd find myself saying it. I'd be washing dishes, and I would go, Bluetooth. <laughs> and it started the day I was doing my family history back to Adam and Eve, and I came across a Viking in my line named Goldtooth. His nickname was Goldtooth. 
when I heard Gold Tooth, I was reminded, oh yeah, there was that famous Viking named Blue Tooth who converted to Christianity. And he's got a, a, a neat story. And since that day, I kept hearing Bluetooth. I would hear people say it everywhere. I just, all day long, Bluetooth, Bluetooth, Bluetooth. I wished I would have written it down in my journal and pondered on it. It's just one of those words I just thought was funny and just kept saying. Well, then, this week, a news article popped up. <laughs> Front page headlines. There it was. I'm going to show you. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Here it is. <clears throat> <laughs> Blue pigment pigment in medieval woman's teeth gives scientists bombshell clue. This is something that's so rare. Bluetooth, you guys! There it was! <laughs> the spirit was letting me know. It was putting he was putting it out there. Bluetooth, Bluetooth, pay attention, something's coming. It has to do with this whole topic you've been pondering on. I'm, I'm gonna give you more. So this article says. <clears throat> that, let's see, a thousand years ago, women were not known for writing or painting with a certain coveted stone. I forget the name of the stone, but it's this blue stone that they would grind up and use the powder to create this blue pigment that they would use in art and for writing. And women were not known to use this stone. Um, <clears throat> it says, let's see, because there's a lack of signatures on some of the pieces of art, it made it difficult to prove that this was the case. It says, nonetheless, monks were known as the primary producers of books throughout the Middle Ages. So everything that was produced was usually done by, by the men. Um, monks were the authors up until um, or this recent study point. But it says, but this piece of evidence right here that comes from a woman's skull, it was dug up from a church, I think in Germany, and they believe it to be the skull of a nun. When they found this piece of blue pigment in her tooth, it was evidence that this woman was using, oh, here it is. It's called lapis lazuli. Um, <clears throat> it challenges these past conceptions. And it said that, that women, when, when artists would use this blue stone, they would put their paintbrush or utensil, whatever they were using, their tool, in their mouth, and pieces, they would, they would wet the tip of the brush. So they would wet it with their saliva and then re-dip it. And so a lot of times you'll find specks of blue in their mouth, but these are usually in the skulls of, of men. Um, and so to find it in a woman's mouth, of, of the remains of an, an old nun, was very, very unexpected. It says this evidence shows that women at the time, particularly nuns, were not only literate, but were also prolific producers and consumers of books. So they did write books, they did produce works, but we don't hear about that. It's, it's been hidden over the centuries. We just think of the monks that produced all these great works. And they interviewed one of the researchers, one of the, the archaeologists, and he said, it's kind of a bombshell for my field. It's so rare to find material evidence of women's artistic and literary work in the Middle Ages. And she says, because things are much better documented for men, it's encouraged people to imagine a male world. Now that's funny because when I was doing my family history, I even shared this in that little video I made to help people trace their lines back. I, I said in there, as you click on the women in the trees, let me transition back over. When you click on the women in your trees, you'll notice there's usually always a dead end at the women because the women's histories, I don't know if it's that they weren't important or crucial, they just didn't record them. The, the, the lines, okay, thanks, honey. The lines are traced back through the men. There were some women um, that came from royal families and they had their lines in the tree, they had their records, but for the most part, many of the women, they're the dead ends. So you click on a husband and wife, you click on the wife, there's nothing beyond her, but you click on the husband and it just goes on and on. So I was able to trace back to Adam and Eve only through a couple women's lines, but the majority were, were the men. She said the same thing. Things back then were much better documented for men. Um, so we imagine this male world, but she says this discovery helps correct that bias. Um, this tooth opens up a window on what activities women were also engaged in. So it's, it's um, kind of enlightening to learn this about our past when we've always been taught something so different. 
So this was exciting. This is something the Spirit wanted to bring to my attention, so I'm sharing it in this video. Completely unexpected. <laughs> I learned something new here. Um, I thought that was pretty neat. So again, it's, it's a manifestation, a witness of what's happening in the supernatural this year. Okay, around this time, random, just random out of the blue, someone sends me a, a Facebook message and just says, hey, here's this podcast I just started listening to. Um, I think you might like it. And so she sent me a link, and I'm going to share it with you because I love it. It's a woman by the name of Lacey Bangerter. And she just started her podcast a few months ago, so it's a new podcast that she posts every week. And I love it. Her topic happens to be all about women. And I had no idea. And it's funny because the person who shared this with me had no idea this was going to be the message for this coming video. I hadn't shared my notes. I hadn't been talking about it. And everything that keeps coming my way has to do with the same topic. So I put a link to her podcast. I highly, highly recommend it. Incredible. And as I listened to, I listened to about four or five episodes. And as I'm listening to her podcast, I'm nodding my head in agreement because it's the same, almost the same experiences I've had. And I've shared a lot of these exper experiences in my videos. But her words... Her experiences were a witness to what I've experienced in my own life and some of the things that I've shared. And she went on her journey four years ago. That's about the time I went on my journey. I've shared in my videos. And she talks about um, a time when she started to notice how women are kind of just hidden throughout history and suppressed and not talked about and on and on and on. She gives lots of examples. And I remember four years ago when I was going through that same struggle I was thinking the same thing, and everything she shared, I thought, yes, I thought of that same example. And, you know, like about uh, the girl babies in China, the girls were aborted and, and the male babies were wanted, and just all these things that send this message to, to girls and women throughout the world that they're not valued, that they're not important. And even though we're taught that we are, we know that's a lie it still gets into your subconscious and it messes with your mind when you see these things happening. And one of the examples she gave, I had written about in my journal way back then, and it was how there's hardly any women mentioned in the scriptures um, compared to how many, how many awesome male heroes there are, especially in the Book of Mormon. And I got thinking about the Book of Mormon. I had written this in my journal, and the only women I could find were, there might, there might have been a few more, were Lehi's wife, King Lamoni's wife, and the mothers of the stripling warriors. <laughs> and even then, it doesn't give a whole lot of details about them. And so, you know, as kids, we're taught, who's your Book of Mormon hero? Who do you want to be like? And, you know, we'd say Nephi, Ammon, but it was always these male guys from the Book of Mormon because there really weren't any women. And, and I'm sure there were. Um, it's just not mentioned in the scriptures. But she talked about this in her podcast, how that would play with her mind and it would really frustrate her and kind of create harm and Satan would use that to distort the way she saw herself. I can relate. And so quickly I'm just throwing this out there, some of these other little tidbits. Um, I, I'll just skip over all that, but I will say I'm in a much different place now and she is too, so we're all kind of experiencing this at the same time, which is interesting. But I have said before, and I'll say it again, that I love how President Nelson um, ministers with his wife, Sister Wendy Nelson. How they minister side by side. Wherever you see him go, you see her. Where in the past, you didn't always see the prophet's wife so often. She wasn't so visible and on the scene as Sister Nelson is. It's almost like they're in this together. It's almost like, <laughs> here's what came to mind. I thought about... How this is how the kingdom of heaven operates. So this is what we're going to see coming. I heard in my mind, when you think about the kingdom of heaven, you think about kings and queens ruling and reigning together. You think about prophets and prophetesses prophesying together. You think about priests and priestesses ordained into their priests and priestesses hoods and, and ministering in those capacities. And so all that came to mind when I thought of Sister Wendy Nelson and how much I love 
I love her messages. I love the support she has for President Nelson, and just she's such a strength to him. They balance each other out so well. They're the perfect representation of that balanced scale, don't you think? Okay, I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, we're almost to the end. Well, we might be done by 1230. We'll see. Um, all right, somebody sent a message in to me. It was either yesterday or the day before, you guys. I would have been done, but I, I, I asked permission. Can I share this? And she said I could. I'm going to share it anonymously. Um, this is what added about four pages to my notes. And I went through it, and I thought, well, I'm just going to summarize it. I can't summarize it, you guys. I have to just say it word for word. So if you bear with me, I'm a fast reader. I, I, I can't leave any of this out. I'm just going to read it. She sent me a message, and basically what she said is, I felt prompted to share this with you over the past several months or weeks, but I haven't done it. But I really feel like I'm to share this with you now. Again, someone else who doesn't know what today's message is about. She had no idea, but she felt prompted. She was supposed to get this to me. She got it to me just in time for this video, which she didn't know I was going to be doing today. <laughs> it's amazing how the Lord works. So she said she'd been collecting in her notes over the past several months lots of interesting things she's seen in the groups that she's in on Facebook. People sharing personal testimonies and personal experiences that are all related to this message. And she didn't know that's what I'd be sharing today. She just felt the need to send it to me. So I'm going to keep, it just had their first names listed. I'm not going to say who these sisters are. I don't know who they are anyways, but I'm just going to read their words. So here's the message. These are just her notes, a collection of, of words from um, dear sisters, probably, I, I think, if not in the church, at least in the body of Christ. Um, she's, she titles it, Daughters of God, your birthing, roaring and about to release the purity and justice of God into the earth. Um, let's see, this comes from a sister. So this is a different sister who she, she took this from. I hope that isn't confusing. Okay, daughters of God, his roar through you is about to get loud. As the Lord is removing limitations from upon you, the Lord is removing the things that have attempted to pervert, twist and hinder what God is doing within you and through you. You have been silenced for too long, and now the Lord is removing the tape from your mouth, and you will speak loudly. Oh, I'm hearing the boom, the boom that I talked about earlier. There's that boom. I saw a roar coming out from within you that is going to shake the nations. Oh, so this woman had a vision. I saw a roar coming out of you that is going to shake your household. I saw a roar coming out of you that is going to shake your workplace. I saw a roar coming out of you that is going to bring about mighty, a mighty move of God in your midst. This roar is the roar that comes from the deep place. Sorry, it's vibrating. From the deep place of the awakening to the true reality of your identity and worth in him. I'm feeling it. <laughs> it's just all coming together. It's all connecting, and this was not planned by me. I see the roar coming out from within you. That is his roar, capital H. And it is bringing things into sudden alignment, and it is activating destiny all around you. The enemy has been attempting to silence you for so long because within you is a message. I'm sorry about this vibrating. I will move this phone. Within you is a message. Within you is a flow. Within you is a roar of heaven that when released, the Lord is going to bring significant breakthrough, change, alignment, and destiny activations all around you. There are new songs that the Lord is birthing through you. The Lord is unlocking the places of captivity within you where the enemy has fought hard to keep your song hidden. Where the enemy has brought you so much shame, condemnation, fear, and insecurity upon you to keep the song the Lord has placed within you, your life message from coming out. That is what I just said from my journal. Daughter of God, it is coming out. It's coming out, explanation point. It's coming out three times. 
It is going to look completely different to the song of another daughter of God, but it has to be different. The Lord is releasing the individual sounds of the daughters of God, but together they flow in harmony, decreeing the sound, He is coming. The King is coming. Make way. Make way for the greatest move of God upon the earth. Make room. Make way. Here He comes. This is in all caps and explanation points. Okay, another sister writes, I am birthing my weapons of purity. Recently, I saw before me in a vision a great multitude of heavenly pregnant women who were, re who were readying the hour of birth. Some were already getting into position to birth the life in their wombs. I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, I am birthing my weapons of purity through my daughters across the earth in this time and season. As I pondered this, I was reminded of a number I have been seeing repeatedly everywhere I go. The number 144. We've talked about that before in our videos. The 144,000. As I asked what this meant, the Holy Spirit led me to Luke 1, 44 through 45, which says, For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed, sorry, and blessed spiritually fortunate and favored by God is she who believed and confidently trusted that there would be a fulfillment of the things that were spoken to her by the angel sent from the Lord. Um, there has been a company of women, God's daughters, who have been in a state of dizziness and confusion, lost, beat down, held back. They have felt as though they have no place, no purpose, no direction, and no voice. But the Father has heard their cries. Okay, to be honest... <laughs> to stop right here. I skimmed over this really quickly because I didn't have time to read it all because it's really long. So this is hitting me for the first time. This is exactly what I just shared in this video. Another powerful witness. You can't make this up. I saw him leading them out of their brokenness into this very hour, shaking away the confusion and the lies and restoring them to a place of honor. I see he is resembling to their wombs new life. And they will birth purity with heavenly strategies to carry out the purpose he has set before them. The life and destiny in the spiritual and physical wombs will walk where no man has walked. And overturn and overthrow strongholds set up by the enemy from generations ago. I just talked about that. <laughs> Somebody else I shared in this video said the same thing. That is why God is using women right now, because they'll be able to break down the strongholds like no man has been able to do up until now because of their great faith. Land, oh, I almost said her name, sorry. Another sister says, um, hers is titled, My Fire is Falling, Releasing the Maidens of Purity. She says, I saw the fire of God falling upon the daughters of God, and a great birthing was taking place. There's that spirit of God. And I asked the Lord what birthing was happening. And the Lord said, These are my maidens of purity. The Lord showed me such a deep work of his spirit and fire upon women right now that was birthing a cry from within them, bringing capital letters, purity, cleansing, and fire to every area that they were sent to minister in. From their houses, to their workplaces, to their cities, nations, the fire of God was being released through them with such love, bringing cleansing, probably also healing. The impartations of fire within their wombs were so huge, so powerful, that as they reached out in their different roles and assignments, the fire of God was being released and bringing such cleansing. Impurity, injustice, perversion, deception was being burnt away as the fire of his love fell powerfully in the different realms of influence and seeing the hold of the enemy removed from those places. All that was left was lives, cities, nations changed by the fire of his love that was released. The fire of God that had fallen upon the daughters of God in this season, the embracing of that fire to allow the Lord to do what he needed to do in their hearts and souls. Um, let's see, was seeing them left with such incredible impartations of his fire that was going to change the world. 
I saw in the fire, in the birthing of the maidens of purity, the roar of the perfect justice and truth of God, being released from their mouths and wombs, releasing a plumb line into all arenas the Lord sent them into. That was releasing the alignment of God, that alignment which brings that balance. Okay, here's another one. It says, they are the Esthers, the Marys, and they are the Deborahs. It's in all caps. Um, continuing on, they were rising up, they were rising up like Esthers, ready to stand for their nation and for their family, for their cities, and stand in the gap to partner with the Lord to bring radical change. They were the Esthers that stood in the gap for the nation. Oh, sorry, I just read that. No, 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 no. Um, okay, they, they were the Esthers that stood in the gap for that nation, but they were also the Marys that know how to sit at his feet and listen to him and delight in who he is. They were the ones who know how to live at his feet in deep surrender and intimacy. Stand for a city, stand for a nation, but also stop for the one. They know how to love like Jesus in different contexts. They stand for justice and release the justice of God like Deborah, Lady Justice. And they lift their hands and hearts in praise to God wherever they go, shifting atmospheres. These are powerful women. And it's not what we're used to hearing about in the media over the years of power-hungry women and women's rights and the whole movement of women crushing men. It's nothing like that. These are women who love everyone. And they know how to nurture and have compassion and charity and um, go after the one with that motherly-like love that is just born within us. Okay, daughters with eyes of fire. I saw the fire of God falling upon the daughters of God in this season, and in this vision it fell upon their eyes, and I heard the Lord say, eyes of discernment. And I saw the daughters of God in every sphere of influence the Lord has released them into, looking into the spirit, into those spheres of influence, and they were seeing with laser point accuracy, and they were seeing the strategy of heaven, the blueprints of God, to map out the new boundaries and mark out what God wanted to do. 311 workers seeking after the will of God. Um, but they were also uncovering the hidden plans of the enemy. And I heard the Lord say, watch the daughters and the way I shall use them to uncover the hidden plots of the enemy and decree my truth to see the plans of the enemy overturned and the tables turned in the spheres of influence I have released them into. Every place the Lord sent them into, and they moved in the discernment of heaven. Their declarations of truth uncovered the treasures of God. What wanted, sorry, what he wanted to do and release, especially in the darkest and messiest of places. I saw a breaker anointing coming forth from within women being activated and awakened to their identity, their purpose, their assignment, and their song in accelerated, accelerated ways in this season. And the birthing, the, the greatest move of God upon the earth is being released. I heard the Lord say, I am releasing an activation anointing through my daughters in this season that is going to activate homes, families, towns, cities, and nations. I saw the daughters of God being mantled with new mantles, and they were titled Tipping Points. The Lord is raising up women right now all across the earth in positions and places of destiny, unlike anything that has ever been seen, with the mantles to release the tipping points of God in homes, families, workplaces, cities, and nations. I asked the Lord about these tipping points, and I heard the Lord say, the tipping points are bringing about birth. Bear with me. <laughs> We're almost getting to the end here. Um, my hat's off to those of you who are still with me right now <laughs> because this is long and I know your Saturday is, is valuable. Okay, shall I bring to the moment of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Or shall I give, sorry, or shall I, who gives delivery, shut the womb, says your God? And it quotes Isaiah 66, 9 through 11. Midwives carrying the activation anointing. 
I saw the hand of God strategically rising up, women in all areas, the seven mountains in suddenly moments right now, and they were being sent in as the midwives. They were being sent in with the activation anointing to release the birthing of God. They were coming in decreeing Isaiah 66, 9 through 11, and suddenly a birthing was taking place. The Lord is releasing his daughters as the midwives to bring the birthing. I heard the Lord say, The enemy has come against women for so long, attempting to hinder the birthing of what I am doing in them and through them. Because of how I am releasing them and rising them up, rising them up, now in the earth to release my birthing in the seven mountains and to usher in the greatest move of my spirit upon the earth. Yes. <laughs> it's just another confirmation. Your story is about to change. I saw the Lord rewriting stories for the daughters of God. I heard the Lord say, I am removing the lines of lies. I saw the Lord removing all the lies that have come against his daughters, and he was changing the story. Woo! The atonement, the power of the atonement. Truth filled the pages, and on top, on the top of every page, it said, Change. The day of change is upon you. The day of change is upon you. That's twice. Everything is about to change in a glorious way. Your best days are upon you. The word best days stood out to me. They were not based upon circumstances. They were based upon the move of his spirit within their lives. What he was implanting, releasing, shaping, and changing in them to release through them. I saw the daughters of God with growing pregnant bellies getting bigger and bigger by the day and the words, wombs of fruitfulness, exploded all around me. I am loving this. What they were going to birth was going to release lasting fruit everywhere they went. But not only was the release of the fruitfulness for their spheres of influence and cities and nations, it was for them too. The fierce repayment of God for all the enemy has stolen coming back to them. The increase of God falling upon them, the promises fulfilled, the clarity of calling, all of it screamed, harvest time. It was time for the daughters of God to rise up, there it is, with the decree into cities and nations. It's harvest time. But the Lord was also decreeing over his daughters for their own lives. Your harvest time has arrived. The lines of lies has been erased. And the rewriting of the truth of God has been released. Unshakable revelation of identity of who he was burned within them. I then saw Jesus place his hand upon their wounds and upon their mouths, and he smiled and spoke. And now you shall go forth and rewrite his story, history. Daughters of God, you have been called for such a time as this. Rise up. You are about to see God do for you and do through you what you have never experienced before. You are being sent out as the midwives into your spheres of influence to call forth the greatest move of God the world has ever seen. It's your time. Arise. Okay, another person writes, I hear the Holy, it's a sister by the way, I hear the Holy Spirit saying, My daughters, now is your time. Let nothing hold you back, for you are moving into my purposes and intentions for your life. You are my weapons of purity. Guard your hearts and your minds, for the enemy would intend to contaminate the purity I have put within you. My purity lived out through you is my weapon in this time of chaos. It will destroy the works of the enemy and cause you to walk in greater authority than you ever have before. Daughter of God, I decree over you today that you are no longer restrained. The enemy cannot withstand the mighty force of God's purity and power that is being birthed from within you. And the chains that have held you back have been broken. We talked about chains today and oppression. Um, you are moving into the perfect will of your Father and the intimacy that you share with him. 
will cause unexpected doors to open before you. Your laid down life is going to be a testament and embodiment of righteousness to the nations and the purity on display through your life will cause others to know Jesus. I decree that what the enemy has stolen from you will be returned and repaid to you 100 fold. I talked about that last year, a couple videos I did about God restoring 100 fold and I had that happen to me. Oh, my videos about my computer and my electronic devices and getting 100% of everything restored. Oh, I'm feeling this. The enemy is no match for you. Lioness daughter, arise in your father's strength today. Go without fear into the destiny that he has called you to. You are his weapon of purity and power. And that's it. That's the end of that. Okay, I just have a couple more notes and we're done. This, I guess, is going to be a three-hour video. I'm sure I'll be done right at one, you guys. I, I just have so much to share. I can't cut it out or sum it up. Okay, so we're talking now about the 2020 Kingdom Tower. Um, the year 2020. Okay, I've got this video, or this, there was a video. Let me show you the image. <laughs> Let's see. Here it is. Okay, a video pops up. My, my son, when I put him to bed the other night, my little four-year-old said, Mom, I want to watch a video for my bedtime story. I want to watch something about skyscrapers. So I thought, oh, okay, well, let's find a video that has to do with skyscrapers. So I found a video about the tallest skyscrapers in the world. He thought it was pretty cool. And I learned in this video, and everything happens for a reason, this stood out to me, the tallest building in the world set for the year 2020. It's supposed to be completed in the year 2020. It will be the tallest building in the world. It is called the Kingdom Tower. There it is behind this man. It was designed by Americans, American architects and engineers, but it's being built in Saudi Arabia. And what's so interesting, you guys, I'm gonna go back, transition back to the camera here. I just had this feeling because it reminded me of the Tower of Babel. I thought of building that tower up to heaven and how you remember, you remember the scriptures, you remember what the Lord did when that happened, right? That building crumbled and those people were scattered. We're now coming to a time when those scattered people are, are being gathered in. They're coming back together. I think there's great symbolism in this tower, but a few different things came to mind. First of all, um, I, the word kingdom stood out to me, kingdom. And it's time for the kingdom of God to come upon the earth. There is definite meaning in that. I don't think that was the intention of the person who named it that. This is in Saudi Arabia, which is a kingdom. It's got princes. It's ruled by um, the kings and princes. And it's, it's a kingdom. And so that's why it's named the Kingdom Tower. There's even an enterprise called like the Kingdom Enterprise, which is who funded this building. So that's why they use the word kingdom. But I think God's also using that word to give a message to us, especially where this is the tallest building in the world. It will be. What's interesting is I heard in my mind, go look up where the Tower of Babel was built. So I looked at a map. This tower here, the Kingdom Tower, is right near the Red Sea. And the Tower of Babel was just a little bit north of there, so, so north of that area. And so all a part of this Saudi Arabia area. And so I, I'm just feeling, I, I, I pondered so much on this, I'm getting... Um, words in my mind about Babylon, how we're to flee from Babylon, we're, we're to enter the kingdom of God and bring about his kingdom and not the kingdom of Babylon or, or the kingdom of the world, the devil's kingdom. We're to pick a side and we're to help grow that. And um, I, I just thought that because this is going to be built in the year 2020, that is the year of God's perfect vision, you guys. That is the year he is preparing to do something awesome, which I believe is what would his perfect vision be? It would be his kingdom on the earth. <laughs> it would be the way life is going to be during the millennium, right? That is what this is pointing us to. Very, very significant to me, and I just wanted to share that with you. Um, real quick, 
I wrote in my notes there are two kingdoms, two kingdoms, the devil's kingdom and God's kingdom. God's perfect vision will be established in the year 2020. His kingdom, the government of heaven, the roles that women play in the kingdom of heaven must be brought to the earth for this to come to pass. Um, what's interesting is I noted, as I was reading about this, I, I ended up searching more about this tower. And it said that it's built, it's built in the gateway to Mecca and Medina. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Which are the two holiest cities in Islam. So it's the gateway, it's the entranceway to Mecca and Medina. Um, I wrote, I felt, I felt, and I'm just going to go out there and say it because I felt it. I can't deny what I felt. I felt that God's kingdom is going to eventually invade this area. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I believe God's kingdom is going to invade this area. The devil's kingdom will be shaken. It will be shaken. It will be removed. It will crumble like the Tower of Babel. This is something to watch for. I think I'm going to pay attention to this kingdom tower and the progress that it makes and the, the headlines that, that it makes and, and just keep it on the forefront because I feel there's something more to this that hasn't happened yet. So I'm just going to keep my eye on this kingdom tower. I think it definitely means something. Okay. All right, you guys. Um, I have one more awesome thing to share with that at the very end. So I just have like two more quick paragraphs. Um, somebody shared a Cleon Skousen article. I have a link to that as well. So you'll see that below. Check back later today. He talked about in this article these different groups. And I'm just going to read what he said about the third group. And to, to know more about what I'm talking about, just go read the article. But he says um, the third group, is, which is during this time that we're, we're heading into, the third group is to help reconstruct the Western Hemisphere. Oh, sorry, the third group to help reconstruct the Western Hemisphere will be the righteous Gentiles who survived the cleansing. This is an interesting group of people. They are of many different faiths. They love the Lord. They bow the knee in contemplation of His coming. They admire His church and love the saints, but they don't join the church. Nevertheless, they want to live under God's law and be a part of God's kingdom. The amazing part is that God extends an invitation to the righteous Gentiles to be a part of the political kingdom of God. Brigham Young knew that a lot of the saints would expect that the kingdom of God would be only members of the church. But President Young said, that is not the way the Lord planned it. Here are his words. See, I'm just about done. The kingdom of God, those living under God's law, consists in correct principles, principles, and it mattereth not what a man's religious faith is, whether he be a Presbyterian, or a Methodist, or a Baptist, or a Latter-day Saint, or a Mormon, he says in quotations, or a Catholic, or an Episcopalian, or a Mohammedan, or even a pagan, or anything else. If he will bow the knee and with his tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ and will support good and wholesome laws for the regulation of society, we hail him as a brother and will stand by him while he stands by us in these things. For every man's religious faith is a matter between his own soul and his God alone. I love that. That is something I live by personally. And that is what we were trying to do. We are trying to do this with this Believers Building Bridges tour. This is our purpose. Okay, this, this brings the video to a close with this last part of awesomeness. Someone also during the week, well, I think it was two weeks ago, sent me this video and she said, I think you, you're going to want to watch this. So I did. Amazing. Again, she didn't know what my message is going to be about. Um... But it all ties in. I have a link to this as well. It's a woman by the name of Lorna Byrne. And she's a visionary woman. Ever since she was a child, there's been no veil for her. She can see everything going on in the supernatural. And she has seen a lot. She's seen a lot of uh, things to come in the future. And she said in her video, it's only three minutes long. She says in this video clip, 
that there is a message of hope for America. She said that she has seen Christian faiths and churches that will be coming together in unity and love. This video was published in 2012. She says it starts in America and then it goes from there out to all the world. It's a movement that spreads. And as I listened to her words, I thought, that's our tour. <laughs> this is so awesome. That's our tour. Our Believers Building Bridges tour. Remember, I've talked about this. We start it here in America. We go from state to state with this message, of the same message that Brigham Young just shared. And from there, we spread it to the entire world. And we bring everyone together in unity, which is necessary for the millennium to be ushered in because that's how we'll be living during the millennium. That's the kingdom of God. And I believe that that's what I've been called personally to rise up and do this year. That is my calling. And many of you out there, I know you felt called to do the same. So let's all join each other and let's be a part of this. Here's what I'm going to end with. <laughs> okay, before I show you this cool image, which made me smile so much. I had a dream. I had a dream the first week of January. I didn't bring my journal in, so I can't show you the date. Um, but I had this dream, and in this dream, I was shown a wall. It was a stone wall. It was like on the side of a hill or a mountain, and it was just this big face of stone. And on there, someone had painted a red heart. It was like a narrow, long, skinny heart that was made up of all the continents on the earth forming together in the shape of a heart. So they had moved in closer together, which kind of reminds me of what's supposed to take place um, as we usher in the millennium, the, the continents coming back together. Um, anyways, it's just that shifting taking place, and it formed a heart. And in my dream, it was red. It was a red heart. And it was so beautiful. And I wanted to recreate it for you and show you, but I didn't have time. I did do a Google search to see if anyone had painted anything like that, and I found um, a blue heart, similar, but... Anyways, that meant a lot to me because it's a, co a confirmation of what I'm sharing and what I'm feeling. Here's what I want to end with today. Before I show you this, I just want to make sure I didn't miss any images that I wanted to show you. I did. I missed an image because that always makes me sad at the end of a video when I skip something I wanted to share. I, I have to save it for the next video. I forgot to show you that when I was talking about Lynn Reidenauer, my friend, talking about how he admires the Latter-day Saints because of that spirit they have within us and we were talking about the spirit of God like a fire. I came across this scripture uh, a while ago, a couple weeks ago, and I, I underlined it and it says, and it came to pass, so it's sorry, verse 13, and it came to pass that when they were all baptized and had come up out of the water, see we just talked about that, the Holy Ghost did fall upon them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire with the Spirit of God. Behold, they were encircled about as if it were by fire. And it came down from heaven, and the multitude did witness, and did bear record, and angels did come down out of heaven and did minister unto them. That's that Spirit of God. And that's what we're going to see. That's what we're going to see happening this year. Okay, let's see. I Oh, I forgot to show you this image. When I was talking about the unicorns and going back through our family history and finding who we were related to, many people found this in their tree. I found an, uh, an image of this from different websites, ancestry websites, and there is a tree out there. There is a branch that many people connect into that someone has created that shows, I'm not going to say, you can just see for yourself, but look at who those parents are. Look at who they come from and look at who descends from them. And I've seen the same branch in other trees, but the names have been changed. So it doesn't say it as blatantly as it does here. It, it has um, Hebrew names. And so that was, that was pretty interesting. I wanted to share that with you. And let's see. I think that's about it. I can now show you my last image. Oh, no, I left out one more thing, guys. You know what? I don't remember even, I must have skipped over that paragraph. I don't even think I talked. Did I talk about Mike Thompson? I had a part in here about Mike Thompson. And if I can't find it, that's okay because 
I included his video down below. There are some Mike Thompson videos, and check this out. I just wanted to show this to you. This was a video I watched at the end of the year, and I saw 13 all over it, which to me is January 3rd, which began the 40-day fast, and that was a powerful video. It's about um, the first words of the new year, so I recommend you watch that. There's also some other videos I put from him on there that are new that have to do with what I just shared. Okay, lastly, are you guys ready for it? Here's what I saw last night as I was closing everything down and getting ready to go to bed. I went into Facebook. I went into Facebook and I went to go into this one group to check something out. And I did a search for the group. It's called The Perfect Day. I know a lot of you are members of this group on Facebook. And look at what I saw last night. 2020! <laughs> As of last night, there were 2,020 members of this group. But what I heard when I took a screenshot of this is 2020, the year 2020, will be God's perfect day because it will be his perfect vision. How cool is that, you guys? You just can't make that stuff up. Okay, before we close and I say goodbye, I, I'm just going to quickly check the comments. I don't want to leave anybody hanging. And then I'm going to sign off, you guys. Thanks so much. This has been so much um, fun, I guess is the word I'm looking for. It's just been awesome to do these videos and joining in the conversation with you. Oh, I was offline. His phone was offline, so now it's refreshing. Now all the comments are popping up. So real quick, you guys, I'm going to address your comments and questions, and then we'll close out. Um, let's see. Beth says, interesting, 14 killed. We just talked about the significance of that number, time for a new era. Yes, Beth, I thought about you. I kind of emphasized my, my voice when I read that in the article, 14 killed, I thought of you. We, we've talked about that. Janice says, where is that video you just mentioned about helping people trace back their family history? Um, if you Google keywords in our group, if you type in search words such as um, video, with my name, Lindsay Video, um, Family History. I, I, I did it the other day to show a friend. That's how you'll find the post that has a video. But if you can't find it, maybe I'll go in later and I'll tag you on it. But I'll also upload that video this week to my channel. So just look for it. It'll just be a separate video on its own. It's only like four minutes long. Um, let's see, Beth. With women's last names changing at marriage, it makes sense or sorry, it makes it easier to lose track of the original surname. Absolutely. That's what I wrote in my journal years ago was how we change our names and we sort of change our identity from our family surname to taking on that of our husbands and kind of focusing, you know, the focus goes that way, down that line. Um, Janice, can we somehow get a printed version of what you shared at the end? It resonates so much with me. I'm going to ask, my my friend, if she's out there watching this right now, who sent, I believe you're talking about what I just read from all those prophetic, it was like a prophetic woman's prophecy. I am going to ask her if she'd like to share a little bit more with me about where that came from or if I have permission to, to share it with you. I'll put it in a blog post because it's a lot. It's a lot of words. So if I'll reach out to her and see if I have permission to post that. I don't see why not since I was able to share it. Um, but I'd like to know more about who, who it came from. Let's see. Beth, the tower thing. Wow, so many parallels with the ancient Tower of Babel. Absolutely, right? That's what I kept hearing over and over. And I kept seeing images in my mind of that old tower crumbling. Nate, great video. Thanks so much. Um, Beth, thanks, Lindsay. This was great. So many insights to think over. Enjoy your Saturday. You too, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Look, it's 12.58. I had two minutes to spare. <laughs> um, I hope you have a wonderful weekend, and I will see you next time, and enjoy the rest of your day.